it's a great pleasure to be here. I had some doubts um, about Australia, to tell you the truth. See, um, back in the 50s when I was uh, about 54, 55, I think, I planned to look it up. Uh, at that time, an ordinary language philosophy, something called ordinary language philosophy, was at its height. And analysis used to have a competition on some subjects, the British magazine. And one competition was really won by a parody of ordinary language philosophy. The winner won with an essay called The Logic of Ophelia Talk. <laughs> and in this parody, um, it was explained that many people are misled by the logical form of Australia sentences to believe that Australia is the name of a place. And that really, of course, this is a, a very bad mistake, analogous to thinking that if I say I did it for Mary's sake, I did it for an object, which is her sake, and that's, well, where is her sake? It calls me her sake, and so on. In fact, in Australia is a sentential operator, meaning not in reality. <laughs> so, for example, we say, in Australia, um, Winter is in August, meaning in reality, winter is not in August. <laughs> and, we say in rea and we say in Australia, there are black swans, meaning in reality, there are no black swans. And I thought of certain additions to this, like in Australia, contradictions can be true. <laughs> certainly. <laughs> So I was a little worried about getting on a plane to Australia. <laughs> but being in Australia turned out to mean not being in reality. <laughs> so I need you to judge whether I am or am not tonight in reality. Now to give you a little orientation on what I'm going to do in these six lectures, not all of them will in fact be on philosophy of mind, but as I think by the end you will see they are all interrelated. Um, these are the titles of the six lectures. As you'll see, tonight's lecture is called Misconstructing the Mind, and we'll deal especially uh, with some famous views of Noam Chomsky, but more recently joined by Steven Pinker. Uh, the second lecture on non-scientific knowledge will move away from philosophy of mind to talk about issues the idea that a great deal that it's a mistake to think that all of knowledge worthy of the name can or should aspire to live up to the standards and form of the exact sciences. That there's a great deal that we know that cannot be forced into that mold, and that we uh, and including importantly normative knowledge, knowledge of values, and I don't just mean ethical values, and, uh, epistemic values, uh, values, and as you'll see, this idea that uh, we'll, we will come back to these ideas when we come back to the philosophy of mind, because I want to argue that a lot of our exaggerated expectations from scientific models, from uh, computational models, neurological models, and so on, valuable as those models are, ways of understanding the brain, that there's lots about our mental life besides the brain, and that lots that cannot be, that is best, uh, that is essentially interwoven, well, not to get ahead of my story, but that is essentially interwoven with normativity. Uh, with valuation, in short, interpretation. Then, uh, in the third lecture, I will talk about skepticism. Again, that's the furthest I'll be from philosophy of mind. And then the last three will all be a, will be a continuous series on philosophy of mind, identity theory, the topics uh, that Chris Mortensen mentioned. Uh, in terms of level of technicality, I'll try to make these accessible. Tonight's may be the hardest. Tomorrow, uh, Thursdays will be the least technical. <laughs> so uh, if you survive tonight, <laughs> you should have an easier time. So, 
Some time ago, my friend, the well-known American linguist Diane Brentari, said to me, I wouldn't find what I'm doing of any interest if I didn't believe that what we are doing when we study language is discovering something about the structure of the mind. Now, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, that was from 1944 to 1948, uh, some of you may feel that's, that's not in reality. <laughs> Uh, I fulfilled the course requirements for a major in three subjects, philosophy, German, and linguistic analysis. Linguistic analysis wasn't yet a department. It was the, uh, Zalig Harris was, ran a program of linguistic analysis, and it had found a home as, a, in the, as an autonomous uh, subsection of the Department of Anthropology. And besides Zalig Harris, Linguistic analysis consisted of two or three teaching fellows in anthropology, some other graduate students, and two undergraduates, Noam Chomsky and myself. And at that time, not one of us would have thought of saying that what we were doing was discovering something about the structure of the human mind. My friend's remark would have been literally unintelligible at that time. What has happened in the meantime is the appearance of a famous hypothesis called the innateness hypothesis. That is the hypothesis that the structure of language is innate in the human mind, and that the task of linguistics is to describe these, this innate structure. In later versions, uh, Chomsky speaks of the innate language organ or the innate system of modules. A module is a kind of miniature computer subserving language skills in the mind. This may have been implicit in Chomsky's syntactic structures in 1957. Actually, I'm not sure it was. I went back and looked at that again, and I can't really find any trace of the innateness hypothesis in syntactic structures, but maybe someone could interpret it in. But it certainly didn't become implicit explicit until Chomsky reviewed Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, in 1959, an epoch-making event. Now, this innateness hypothesis was not a new hypothesis about phenomena which were already recognized to be the subject matter of linguistics. If anything deserves the overused title of a paradigm change, it is Chomsky's innateness hypothesis. The mark of a paradigm change, or what French philosophers refer to as a coupure epistemologique, is that it doesn't simply offer new answers to old questions, but it rather changes our understanding of what the questions are. It makes it possible to ask questions that would previously have been unintelligible. That, that is exactly what the appearance of the innateness hypothesis did. It is not, I hasten to add, that all linguists, let alone all cognitive scientists, accept the new paradigm. But for those who do, the conception of linguistics, and increasingly the conception of cognitive science as well, is unlike anything that we have seen before, notwithstanding Chomsky's habit of claiming that Descartes and the rationalists were his forerunners. <laughs> the structure of arguments for innateness. The general structure of arguments for innateness is as follows. The proponent of the innateness hypothesis describes a complex linguistic skill S that, he asserts, all children who are not severely retarded have the ability to acquire. Two, the process by which children acquire S is shown not to be one that learning theory can explain. That is, not to be one of the familiar mechanisms of learning theory, Hull or Skinner or even Estes can explain. It's not, Chomsky showed, simply a matter, learning your language, your native language, is not simply a matter of schedules of reinforcement and stimulus generalization and response generalization and so forth, all those things that were taught by the textbooks of behavioral psychology when I was young. 
More precisely, Chomsky argues that if one widens the notions of stimulus, response, quality, space, etc., sufficiently so that one can regard the acquiring of S and like skills as an example of, quote, habit formation in the sense of standard learning theory, then one will have had to widen them in the process to such an extent that the explanations turn out to be empty. This strategy was brilliantly employed by Chomsky in the above-mentioned review of Skinner's verbal behavior. At one point, for example, he points out at one point when Skinner is explaining verbal behavior and meaning and reference, he has to refer to all of World War II as a stimulus. <laughs> in, in, the, in the lectures he gave in Nicaragua, the Managua lectures, the title Language and the Problems of Knowledge, this was back in 1988, Chomsky argues convincingly that such familiar abilities as the ability of children to learn without explicit instruction that the word book has both a concrete and an abstract sense. Here, I wrote three books, and there are 300 books in my library. <laughs> uh, are beyond classical learning theory. An example of the use of the word in the first sense is, this book weighs two pounds. An example of the use in the second sense is, John wrote this book. Another example used in the same lectures is the ability of children to learn that in such sentences as, who did John cause to shave himself, the original example was in Spanish. The reflexive pronoun himself, se, refers to the person John caused to shave and not to John, even though John is the name closest to the reflexive pronoun. The subtle explanation of this ability involves the presence of a, quote, trace of a, an invisible trace of a pronominal object in the deep structure between cause and himself even though this trace, as I said, is not visible in the sense it's actually produced. Three, the same arg argumentative strategy was used by Steven Pinker. Uh, I'm referring now to Pinker's uh, PhD thesis and to a long, published as uh, a long article later on. Uh, to argue that the ability to, to acquire even such elementary features of English language as the past tenses of verbs cannot be explained by, by appeal to the idea that the brain is a connectionist architecture. This was important because connectionists had cited precisely the alleged ability of uh, computers with connectionist programs to learn the past tenses of verbs as one of the great successes of that architecture. And what Pinker showed is that, yes, but the machines cannot learn exceptions. Uh, Pinker's uh, however, Pinker's arguments may not apply to more recent and more powerful connectionist architectures, I should add. Now, we have to disentangle the issues. That is the job of philosopher par excellence from Socrates on. My purpose is not to review the empirical data or to challenge these conclusions. I take it that indeed classical learning theory is either bankrupt or empty as an explanation of the acquisition of complex linguistic skills. And I will not presume to decide whether connectionist approaches can succeed. But where do we go from there? What Chomsky, where Chomsky and Pinker go is to conclude that the ability of children to acquire these skills is explained by the alleged fact that the skills are innate. But first of all, let us ask what innate is supposed to mean. In Chomsky's own development, it has meant different things at different times. Early on, the idea of innateness was that the rules of universal grammar are represented in the brain. Thus, 20 years ago, Chomsky was happy to write, with the progress of science, we may come to know something of the physical representation of the grammar and the language faculty. Correspondingly, the cognitive state involved in language learning and the initial state in which there is a representation of UG, universal grammar, but of no specific grammar corresponding to UG. The idea that there's a representation of universal grammar, whatever exactly that might mean, 
in the initial state was later dropped by Chomsky. He now says it is not necessary to suppose that the rules of the postulated universal grammar are themselves represented in the brain. It's only necessary to suppose that the brain is so composed that when it functions according to what he calls its competence, the speaker uses language in accordance with those rules, and that the difference between the surface grammars of the various natural languages can be explained by supposing that certain parameters get set differently as a result of speakers growing up in one linguistic environment or another. Thus, in 1988, we find him writing, we may think of the language faculty as a complex and intricate network of some sort associated with a switch box consisting of an array of switches that can be set in one of two positions. Unless the switches are set one way or another, the, the, state, the system does not function. When they are set in one of the permissible ways, then the system functions in accordance with its nature, but differently depending on how the switches are set. This fixed network is the system of principles of universal grammar. The switches are the parameters to be fixed by experience. That's a little like saying that a telephone switchboard is the system of principles of electricity. <laughs> The data presented to the child learning the language must be sufficient to set the switches one way or another. When these switches are set, the child has command of a particular language and knows the facts of the language, that a particular expression has a particular meaning, and so forth. Chomsky refers to the hypothetical system of switches as the language organ, and he describes it as a system of language modules. Think of a module as a tiny special purpose computer, like the computer in uh, your car that tells you in English nowadays, or Swedish, or whatever, <laughs> that your battery is getting low, or the oil needs to be changed, or the temperature, or so on. So. Uh, the idea is just as there are certain organs, the hands, which natural selection has adapted to certain tasks, so there are mental organs, brain organs, subpersonal processors in the brain, which have evolved to carry out various linguistic tasks, and that the structure of language, which he calls the universal grammar, is just a reflection of the computational structure of these modules, the computational structure of the language organ. What I contend is that this way of describing the innateness, innateness hypothesis entangles together two issues which need to be separated. The failure to disentangle these issues is fatal to clarity about the foundations of linguistics. And since linguistics is being used as a paradigm of mental science, uh, too much else. These two issues are, one, the existence of linguistic universals, and to the language organ hypothesis. I shall argue that the anti-Skinnerian evidence that is always cited is indeed strong evidence for the existence of linguistic universals, but let me add, in a weak sense. That is, the existence of traits that make languages easier for humans to learn. The, the, but that the step from the existence of linguistic universals to the language organ hypothesis is an illegitimate one. And indeed, I think the language organ hypothesis is science fiction rather than a scientific hypothesis. Uh, the reason I say uh, linguistic universals in a weak sense is one, one makes a strong claim that languages which don't exist certain features that we find in the languages we encounter would be impossible for a child to learn there are serious conceptual problems about just what sort of impossibility is meant. Are the two issues really different? To see that they are different, at least in logic, it is sufficient to realize that one, the brain is an exceedingly complex system concerning the details of whose architecture we are almost completely in the dark. For example, uh, about four or five years ago, um, 
Jacob Schwartz, uh, one of the great computer scientists in the world, and one of an immense polymath, said, we do not know for certain the function of the individual neuron. To any computational system that is capable of displaying learning at all, can learn some things more easily and other things with greater difficulty or not at all, depending on the peculiarities of its architecture. Three, if we discover that all children everywhere are capable of learning some linguistic fact or acquiring some linguistic skill relatively easily, then the ability to learn or acquire the item in question must indeed have a material basis in the structure of the brain. Similarly, the fact that other things that we might a priori expect them to be able to learn with equal ease are learnable only with difficulty or only by exceptional individuals must likewise correspond to facts about the limits of the computational structure or even the physical structure of the brain. But for none of this means that the relevant facts about the computational or physical structure of the brain must be facts about some one part or some one subsystem in the brain. If that is true, it must be shown by additional evidence. In fact, uh, neuroscientists sympathetic to connectionism has re have recently argued that there is no good evidence, neurological evidence for the existence of a language organ as a uh, neurologically distinguishable part of the brain. In sum, the existence of linguistic universals is an important fact, if it is a fact, and it is an important re empirical research project to discuss just what the linguistic universals are. One cannot go directly from the existence of linguistic universals to the existence of a language organ. It may be that in certain cases, perhaps in the case of what ordinary people like you and I would count as syntax as opposed to semantics, evidence for the existence of specialized modules can be provided. It is not my intention to investigate this question here. The proponents of the innateness hypothesis do not limit the hypothesis to what you and I would call syntax, so say the uh, declension of the verb or the conjugation of the noun or the uh, grammatical arrangement of words in a sentence. As we saw in the quotation from Chomsky, they include the meanings of words in the scope of their hypothesis, which means if the innateness hypothesis is correct, then all concepts, including carburetor, uh, television set, video camera, uh, were provided for by human evolution about 30,000 years ago, ready-made. Uh, remember that quotation, when these switches are set, the child has command of a particular language and knows the facts of the language, that a particular expression has a particular meaning, and so forth. Yet, as I shall try to bring out, there's an enormous difference between observing that something about the structure of the brain makes it possible for children everywhere to learn the meaning of the word carburetor. I take it that's the sort of thing that's called a linguistic universal. And the claim that there's a fixed and computational subsystem of the brain and a finite list of parameters so that given the description of that subsystem and the values which are just zero or one of each of the parameters the way the speaker will use the word carburetor is completely described both Jerry Fodor in the language of thought where he first put forward his hypothesis all concepts are innate one of Fodor's recently uh, well, I think he's given it up. I'm not sure. I've been the Elm and the expert. It seems to me that Fodor is now giving this up. And more recently, Steven Pinker in The Language Instinct argued that unless there were an, an innate language of thought, which they call mental ease, and unless each concept that human beings can learn is expressible in mental ease, it would be impossible to learn the meanings of words. The above quotation from Chomsky does not commit him to that view. However, it does commit into the possibility of a rigorous computational description of the particular meaning that any word has. Given the computational description of the language organ, the description of the meaning of any word would consist in the specification of the values of a certain subset of the parameters on Chomsky's view. 
Moreover, Chomsky and Fodor both draw a distinction between the wide, what they call the wide content of a word, a notion I introduced so many years ago, in which I now I repent of having introduced <laughs> this distinction. But we will come, we will be talking about this distinction a good deal at the end of these lectures. They draw a distinction between the wide content of a word, that is, the meaning including the real world reference and the narrow content, the computational description of the way the brain employs the word in the sentences it produces, although Chomsky does not use this terminology, and it is only the narrow content that they claim to be in the brain. Uh, Fodor holds that it is possible to give a causal theory of reference, which is what wide content depends on, while Chomsky holds that the nature of reference is and always will remain a mystery. And the top, therefore, the topic is best left, he says, to philosophers and novelists <laughs> to speculate about. In order to begin to see what is wrong with the idea that all concepts, that is, all narrow contents, are innate, let us begin with the sheer, and I've hinted at this already, the sheer evolutionary implausibility of the claim. To have given us a stock of innate notions, which includes carburetor, bureaucrat, fermion, etc., as required by the Fodor-Pinker version of the innateness hypothesis, evolution would have had to be able to anticipate all the contingencies of future cultural and physical environments. And how could it possibly do that? One way, but one which none of these authors explicitly suggest, would be the following. It might be thought there's some basic stock of concepts which we need in all environments, say observation terms and logical terms, that is terms for observable qualities and logical terms, and perhaps notions of space, time, and causality. And all our remaining concepts are in some way explicitly definable by means of these. But the whole tendency of philosophy of science in the last half century or last three quarters of a century has been to demolish the idea that most scientific terms are definable in terms of any fixed stock. And Fodor himself, indeed, has, has been a leader in bashing that idea. But if the stock of terms we have to learn is not reducible to some small basic stock, how was evolution supposed to have selected for it? How was evolution supposed to have given us an innate possession of such unlikely concepts as carburetor and positive charge? To this question, Massimo Pietelli Pavarini, a good friend of mine, has responded that when Niels K. Jern first proposed in 1955 that the body produces antibodies in all possible configurations, there was enormous reluctance to believe this, and yet that hypothesis turned out to be true. Uh, Pietelli goes on to claim that it's hard to find arguments that the situation must be any different in cognitive matters. But actually, it's not so hard to find a counter-argument. It's misleading to say that the immune system produces an image of, quote, any possible molecular pattern, unquote. What it does is to produce randomly all possible combinations up to a certain length of a half a dozen or so elements whether the result is an image of a possible molecular pattern or not. But concepts are not random combinations of elements, or at least no one has given any sense of the claim that they are. Uh, Chomsky himself, by the way, made it pretty clear, although he's never written on this, that he doesn't believe the theory of evolution. But that's a rather drastic. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, in the next section, I'm going to try to show that the, that the claim that a, the particular meaning or the syntax in Chomsky's extended sense, so with the syntax of the term includes what most people would call it semantics, of each word can be described by specifying the values of a finite list of parameters is in deep trouble. To do this, we now turn to the relevance of Gödel's famous second incompleteness theorem. The Gödel theorem, I can imagine you, some of you thinking, of what possible relevance is that? <laughs> but actually the relevance is fairly immediate. First of all, Chomsky's claim is a claim about the meanings of all words. So if it's correct, it applies also to the word proof, or as I shall say, demonstration, to remind you that I'm talking about log logical mathematical proof, not about empirical proof, as when we speak of proving that the suspect is guilty. 
Presumably just about anybody can learn a tiny bit of geometry or a tiny bit of arithmetic and can learn to use the word demonstration in connection with the kinds of reasoning that go on here. But perhaps I'm moving too quickly. Although Chomsky does not believe that there's such a thing as general intelligence, he does believe that there's such a thing as, quote, the scientific faculty, unquote. Perhaps he would say that although most words require only the language organ to learn, it requires the, quote, scientific faculty, unquote, which is supposed to work more slowly and not to be as equally developed in all speakers as the language organ, to learn such words as demonstrated. However, Chomsky holds that the scientific faculty, too, is modularized uh, for the same sorts of reasons that he accepts in the case of the language organ. The failure of behaviorism and connectionism and so on, or their alleged failure. So it doesn't matter for my purposes of my argument whether the supposed module is supposed to be part of the language organ or part of the scientific faculty. Quite simply, the argument is that I'm going to offer is that if Chomsky is right, we could in principle demonstrate what he calls our competence in the use of the word demonstrate recursively, that is simulated on a computer. And that would mean that we could effectively enumerate, that is build a computer to list if it were allowed to go on working forever, all of the truths of say elementary number theory that the human mind can demonstrate. Now at this point, I want to distinguish my argument from rather notorious argument that Roger Penrose made in a book called Shadows of the Mind. And that argument is actually fallacious. And it's, uh, in fact, the American Mathematical Society reprinted my rebuttal of that argument in the New York Times. Uh, but we can argue along a different path, Penrose, along a different path than Penrose. Suppose we take it as a justified assumption that any purely mathematical statement that a speaker who makes no performance errors can demonstrate is true. This certainly seems to be part of our concepts of justification and demonstration. That although the consistency of the effectively innumerable set of statements that we can demonstrate to be true is not itself one that we can demonstrate to be true, this is where Penrose slips up. You can't demonstrate it to be true even with the aid of this assumption because we would have to use empirical knowledge, knowledge of the module in question and the values of the parameters to define the set precisely. Still, if we could know the description of the set in question, that is, if we can know the mathematical description of the set of all truths that a competent human mathematician can prove, or even in, a, even in a restricted but sufficiently strong field like elementary number theory, then the consistency statement, the statement that that whole set of statements is consistent, is one that we could justify. Justify but not mathematically prove. As I say, this is where Penrose slips up, because you have to use empirical assumptions. But now you can run an argument like Girdle's. I'll sketch it for, the, for you. This is why I say this is the most technical of these lectures. We can run an argument like Girdle's again using the notion of justification instead of the notion of demonstration. And if you could describe our competence in the use of the notion justified given evidence E recursively, that is to say computationally, as we should be able to do on Chomsky's picture of the mind, the result will be a real contradiction. And by the way, Chomsky, I've checked with Chomsky, and he does believe that the distinction of what's justified and not justified epistemically is also one that is modularized in the human brain and could in principle be described computationally. <laughs> to give you the flavor of my argument, Gödel's proof depended on the fact that if a set of sentences is effectively innumerable, that just means listable by a computer, either in a finite time or in an infinite time, then there is a sentence of number theory, often called a Gödelian sentence, which is true if and only if it does not belong to the innumerable set in question. That is true, by the way, for, uh, or if it's Gödel, uh, that, 
that, that, by the way, is true for any effectively enumerable set of sentences, for example. So if you list, have the computer list all sentences whose length is the sum of 16 prime numbers, then Gödel's technique will give you a sentence which is true if and only if its length is not the sum of 16 prime numbers. Gödel employed this fact to argue that since a set of sentences that can be proved in formalized mathematics can be effectively enumerated, that is, listed by a computer, it, there is a sentence of number theory, which is true if and only if it does not belong to the set of sentences that can be proved. My former student, uh, George Bulos, who I dearly miss, died at the age of 54 last year, actually published a paper called Gödel's Proof in Words of One, in which he gave an outline of the proof literally in words of one syllable. Instead of consistent, of course, he had to say good, and instead of inconsistent, no good. And the final was, if math can prove that math is good, then math is no good. <laughs> now, this same fact that for any uh, listable set of sentences, listable by a computer, finite or infinite, you can find, you can find a sentence which is true if and only if it's not in the list, that's nowadays called the diagonal lemma, Gerdo didn't even give that important lemma a separate name. The diagonal lemma implies that if the set of sentences the human mind can justify on given evidence is effectively innumerable, as it is on Chomsky's picture, then there's a sentence of number theory which is true if and only if it does not belong to that set. But that true if and only if belief in it isn't justified by the given evidence. Now let's continue reasoning. Now suppose Chomsky is right, and there's some evidence E which justifies believing that such and such a module, such and such a recursive procedure, captures or simulates our justific justificatory competence. Since the procedure is recursive, that is substitute computational, I, know, I think myself, some mathematicians, I think the term recursion theory should not just be replaced by computation theory, and recursive functions should just be called computable functions. Uh, since the procedure is recursive, the set of all sentences in the hypothetical language of thought in mental ease that it is justified to believe on evidence E is an effectively innumerable set. And so just as Gödel showed that there's a sentence which is true if and only if it is not formally provable, so we can show there's a sentence S which is true if and only if it is not justifiable either mathematically or with the aid of the evidence E. If we had the evidence E, we could produce this sentence and argue as follows. This is, by the way, a simpler version uh, using weaker assumptions of uh, an argument of mine in a paper called Reflexive Reflections, which we put in one of my two Harvard volumes. Uh, I forget what, I think it's uh, either uh, Realism of the Human Face or Words and Life. We could argue as follows. We now know on the base of evidence E, this is by, by hypothesis, we know on the base of evidence E that what is enumerated by this procedure is just the sentences that are justifiable. But if S is justifiable, it's not true. So I cannot accept S as justifiable. And I know this by this very argument and without using any information beyond E, empirical information beyond E. So in evidence E, S is not justifiable. So S is true because what S says is that on evidence E it's not justifiable. And I've just discovered and I've just justified this claim. So either I've not discovered the module which captures the notion of justification after all, or my very notion of justification is incoherent. The upshot of these Gerdelian reflections is not, let me repeat, what Roger Penrose hopes for, a proof that the performance of the brain as a whole cannot be simulated by a computer. But it is a proof that if there's a recursive description of our competence in the use of such epistemic notions as demonstrate and justify, then it must be beyond our powers, our powers in principle and not just de facto to know that description. Our powers in principle and not just de facto to know that description. In recent writings, I've argued that at least at present, 
this, the functionless program, which I started, yes, is empty. Empty because the notion of a computational description of meaning presupposes that we have at least an idea of what a possible form for such a description might be. Lacking such a description, even the notion of a computational state becomes a we know not what. Moreover, the fact that the interpretations of our propositional attitudes depend on environment, on context, and on the shape of our conceptual system as a whole, that meaning is holistic in more than one sense, suggests that the identification of any particular of, a, of any particular propositional attitude, say the propositional attitude of believing that there are churches in Vienna, that's an example we'll be using a lot later in these lectures, identifying, understanding the meaning of or having the capacity to think the thought that there are churches in Vienna with anything as rigid as a fixed program is unrealistic. In the case of the proposal that the scientific faculty is itself modularized and that our scientific competence can be completely recursively described, the situation is even worse than in the case of my former functionalist proposals. In the case of my own proposals, there was at least no contradiction in the idea that we might someday give talk, content to talk of the computational description of the states in question. If a proposal that we do not know how to cash out, do not know how to take even a first step to investigating the proposal, and that's what I claim the proposal that propositional attitudes are compositional states, computational states was, is a mere we know not what, then what are we to say about a proposal that we know could never be cashed out? The notion of recursive description of our scientific faculty is totally vacuous. What my Gordelian argument shows is that there's at least one concept which we are able to acquire, but such that it isn't the case that there's some describable module, some describable computational widget, whose structure, whose innate grammar, so to speak, completely captures our competence in the use of that notion. In short, either something is wrong with the modularity hypothesis or something is wrong with the notion of competence. But none of this goes against the thought that there may be significant universal generalizations to be made about how human speakers do or do not employ the notions of demonstration and justification. This illustrates the way in which inferences from the existence of linguistic universals to the existence of mental organs are fallacious. But let us reflect, close by reflecting on this example. How might Chomsky evade the argument just given? What follows are some reflections triggered by this question. One, rejecting the competence performance distinction and saying that what's at stake is the existence of a module responsible for our performance and not the description of our competence would circuit my Gerdelian, short circuit my Gerdelian argument. But this is not a real option for Chomsky or for modern linguistics itself, for that matter. From syntactic structures onward, the arguments for the existence of linguistic universals have presupposed that the, cog that the competence performance distinction is in place, as have the later arguments for modularity. To appreciate why this is so, it suffices to employ Wittgenstein's discussion of following a simple and arithmetical rule as keep adding two to the number you are given to start with. If we were not allowed to prescind from performance errors, if the very notion of a performance error were not allowed, then we couldn't even say that what the speaker does when given the number 11 is to produce the sequence 13, 15, 17, dot, dot, dot. For that is not what the speaker quotes it does. If every slip of the tongue, every response produced by fatigue, every failure to remember the preceding digits correctly, etc., is taken to be part of the output we are asked to account for. Indeed, no module smaller than the whole grain, or better, the whole speaker plus the environment, can predict the whole of the speaker's output, warts and all. When we postulate a simple process under an idealized description, according to which what the process does is errorlessly perform the calculation 
given n, output n plus 2. This is what Wittgenstein calls using the machine as symbol, as opposed to thinking of the machine as an engineer does. When we think of an idealized machine as a process responsible for producing the series, we have already decided to discount any occasion on which the speaker says that it might be uh, 222634 plus 2 equals 22636 as a performance error. That is, the speaker made the mistake of dropping one of the initial twos. The whole structure of linguistic theory and cognitive science presupposes that the competence performance distinction is in place. Two, a better line of argument against the relevance of Gardelian considerations would be to insist on the distinction between linguistic competence and scientific competence and jettison the claim that the idea of a recursive characterization of scientific competence, which after all is a utopian idea of Chomsky's that few of any other thinkers would accept. Indeed, at a first blush, this seems to do the trick. For we can then say that to know the meaning of the word demonstrate, it's not necessary. You don't have to be able to follow complex proofs. You don't have to have possess, in other words, mathematical competence. Somebody who can follow only the very simplest arithmetical or logical or geometrical arguments can easily show that he understands the word demonstrate. If what is included in our grasp of the literal meaning of the word demonstrate is limited enough, no Gradelian argument can get started. For Gradelian arguments, presuppose an understanding of metallurgical reasoning, mathematical induction, and so on. The Gardelian argument I referred to does indeed explode the claim that there's a recursively surveyable scientific faculty, but why should the linguist on the street follow Chomsky in that bit of metaphysical speculation? But now a different problem arises. The very fact that I just suggested we exploit to avert the threat of Gardelian arguments uh, and as I say, there are uh, arguments which, however strange it may be to introduce them into a lecture on linguistics and the mind, are nevertheless perfectly appropriate when you make the notion of competence as utopian, as Chomsky does. The fact that we acquire very, is that we require very little of speakers when it is just a question of knowing the literal meaning of the word demonstrate and not of exhibiting some idealized competence of demonstrating mathematical truth. However, that fact cannot realistically be separated from such other by now familiar facts, which is a thing we will talk about in later lectures, as the fact that no one fixed set of skills, no fixed set of linguistic skills and, and non-linguistic skills interwoven with them is required before we can say that a speaker knows the meaning of the word demonstrate or indeed of any word. Moreover, even if a speaker exhibits a lot of skill at using the word, some further bit of corpus may reveal that he doesn't after all have the concepts we thought we ha he had. If a speaker one day refuses to call something a demonstration because the Dalai Lama does not approve of it, we might have to revise our whole account of the meaning of this lexical item in his idiolect. This is, of course, the notorious problem of meaning holism. But I do not wish to end on a downbeat note. It would be bad to end my first Gavin David Young lecture on a downbeat note. Nothing in what I've been saying argues against arguing goes against the claim that there are linguistic universals even at the level of semantics, as I said, at least in a weak sense, or that there are cognitive universals. Our cognitive competences are open textured and as a rule not recursively surveyable. But of course they're dependent on the sort of organism we are. That is why it makes sense to retain the idea of looking for linguistic universals even if we must jettison the idea of a set of parameters or a language of thought or whatever, hidden invisibly behind and, quote, explaining each and every one of the universals we succeed in finding. What then is the right response to Diane Brentari's remark that what makes linguistics interesting is that we are finding out something about the human mind? Well, of course you are in the sense in which any social science, in the sense in which all of history, 
in the sense in which every human achievement and every human disaster teaches more about the nature of our minds or better about human nature period but not in the science fiction sense for that is what i claim it to be that goes with the utopian programs i've been criticizing thank you among the questions that professor putnam was asked was one about the relationship between language and animal noises and what we can learn from animals my oldest friends uh from my very first year of teaching in 1953 uh there's a man called Alan Gardner who with his wife Trixie uh brought up Washo of course when they started teaching Washo language they were absolutely vilified by the Chomsky I mean the, the, there was a campaign first of all there was a smear campaign there was an attack on the rigor of their methods just about everything they claimed was subsequently um verified using additional controls in some cases crazily elaborate controls no matter how you restricted how the the conditions under which the chip entry was observed and in fact some of those, the the gardeners very carefully avoided publishing what was purely anecdotal although the anecdotes i got from them were amazing for example Al, like most professors and especially when he became famous because of Washer was always going away on an airplane some place like your vice chancellor <laughs> and one day when a plane was flying overhead Washer pointed to the airplane and said sit sign you me go bye bye <laughs> uh after the data themselves could not be uh overturned that the Chomsky simply redefined language so that Washer didn't have language in the process so that a 2-year-old human doesn't have language although earlier they they had in fact used a different definition of language and insisted that 2-year-olds 2 and 1/2 year olds and so on do have language there's no doubt that chimpanzees fail to keep up with humans beyond say 2 and 1/2 or so to the disappointment of the gardeners and others but they certainly have the line between lang- animals possessing language and animals lacking language will never again i think be a sharp line in that sense we have uh, learned something interestingly a- an unexpected offshoot of that is that when you teach a chimpanzee to sign you change its mentation the performance of signing chimpanzees on tasks which do not involve language at all is much higher than a chimpanzee who has never been introduced into this pandora's box of symbolization in a language and with respect to the significance of the girl thing which is obviously a uh, tremendously debated the fact that penrose could publish two best sellers exploiting in a way that every professional mathematical logician regards as fallacious i don't care if he is the most small professor of mathematics at the university of cambridge uh you know when i negatively reviewed his books i was speaking for the whole logical community we know that that argument was a fallacy but there's clearly a lot of excitement there and indeed girl did do something very remarkable i mean as someone said the only thing more remarkable then the fact that there are truths of mathematics that you cannot prove even using these marvelous axioms that the great geniuses of 19th and early 20th century mathematics like David Hilbert produced is the fact that the human mind could know such a fact <laughs> and we did, we did learn something uh both about our aspirations <laughs> our powers and our limits from the girdle set Another question was on how diminished experience could be reconciled with innateness. The, the the brain of course has a complex developmental history. And one of the things that Jerry Adelman has stressed is going out of his Nobel Prize winning work in biology is that first of all the number of brain cells that are that come into existence at least briefly uh is far far greater by orders of magnitude than the number of brain cells you will have as an adult 
There's a selection, a competition to survive among the brain cells. That's, this is the reason, just to summarize briefly Edelman's chief data on what's called neurodarwinism. First of all, because which brain cells you have as an adult is the result of an unpredictable struggle for existence, identical twins do not have the same brain cells. Second, uh, the, there is no complete wiring diagram of the brain in the DNA. The amount of, in, great as the amount of information is that the DNA code is capable of encoding, it's again smaller by orders of magnitude than what it would take for a complete wiring diagram of the brain. The brain, like Australia, has to develop historically and contingently. Again, another reason why even identical twins or clones, or if they come to be human clones, will not have identical brains. Thirdly, as on the sort of modified, uh, Edelman doesn't like to be called a connectionist, he likes battery connectionism, but the difference is they're still fine. I mean, they have to do with degrees of biological re uh, realism, but I would say in a broad sense, it, uh, uh, he is a connectionist, and in connections models supported by direct neurophysiological data from implanting microelectrodes in the brain, what happens as you learn, say, to recognize patterns, we know very little about the operations of the brain beyond vision and pattern recognition. But as you learn to recognize patterns, groups of cell assemblies are recruited. This is something first conjectured by Head in a famous book called The Organization of Behavior, I think back in 1960 or earlier. But groups of cells are recruited. Little computers are generated in the brain. They're not born. The ability to form them is inborn. But there's this very plastic architecture which allows modules to be formed by experience. This is what the Chomskyans don't like. <laughs> uh, and these and there's a concentrating back and forth of neurons between these modules. A module that is not used very much will lose neurons to other modules. If you uh, don't very often touch things with the back of your hand, modules which are originally, say, sensitive to stimulation on the back of the hand will join the group that picks up stimulation from the front of the hand. So. Don't knock what history and contingency can do. <laughs> I mean, these are, they must be innate, you know, supported. This reminds me of medieval reasoning <laughs> in the bad sense. I mean, there's a lot of medieval reasoning that I like, but this is <laughs> superstition, I think. <laughs> superstition, I think. I wish to speak about a question which has been the focus for my philosophical interests for the past 20 years. The existence of and the importance of knowledge outside of the mature sciences. I call this non-scientific knowledge in a non-prejudicial sense of the term non-scientific. And in particular, I include under this label of non-scientific knowledge the existence of knowledge of values in the widest sense. It's in the widest sense because I don't need to limit that to so-called ethical or moral values. Uh, it, it is, in a, at least in philosophical parlance, if not in ordinary parlance, a value judgment to say that anything is better or worse than anything else, a better way of life or a better course of action or a better theory in science or better interpretation of a text. In particular, philosophers, even if they don't do literary theory, are constantly arguing about what's the better interpretation of one or another philosophical text, even contemporary articles. And by mature sciences, I mean, with again, in a non-prejudicial sense, and, and without the, it's a bad term, I should really change that, because that implies somehow that the other sciences are immature, or that all sciences aspire to maturity in some one pattern. And I realize now that I don't like that mature science. So I should say perhaps the paradigmatic science. I mean, and I take it our, for better or worse, our paradigm of a science 
is physics, but I'll say a little more about that. So this focus uh, on the idea, which I think is enormously important, that their knowledge is not confined to the kind of knowledge that we find in physics, molecular biology, chemistry, and nor does all, should all knowledge aspire to resemble the knowledge we have in these paradigmatic sciences. That focus has naturally led me to point out how our paradigmatic science, which I take to be physics, itself depends on judgments which are non-scientific. It's not that there's this wonderful stuff all by itself called paradigmatic science, and then there's this other stuff which some people think is second rate and some people think is even better, <laughs> called non-scientific knowledge, but science itself is like an iceberg floating on an ocean of non-scientific knowledge, uh, of what Kant called good judgment. Now, it's led, this has led me into the controversial question of how it's possible for value claims to be objective. And that in turn led me to a close reading of the American pragmatists, who were my predecessors in the study of all of these problems. Fortunately, I had a few courses in them in college, even if I'd forgotten that <laughs> for a number of decades in, in between. What I would like to do tonight is give an account of the general conclusions to which I've come, and in contrast to last Thursday's lecture, which was technical, and to do so in as non-technical a way as possible. Now, this is not something that philosophers very often do nowadays. This is not something we in Anglo, I should say Anglo-American philosophers, Anglo-Australian American philosophers, are not socialized to do this. We're socialized to do the, for a strange ritual in which we read papers to one another on some fairly well-defined topic. But if philosophy is to retain its connection to the wide human concerns, which have always been its very reason for existence, every so often a philosopher must speak not as a channel for a particular argument or thesis, but as an individual who embodies a point of view point of view which, like all human points of view, has a formulation which is idiosyncratic, but which the philosopher hopes embodies insights that are something more than idiosyncratic at the end. For this reason, I shall allow myself not only to sketch a point of view rather than argue for it in detail, but I shall allow myself to explain why I hold it but in part by describing the particular way in which it developed in the course of my writing and teaching, or at least the sequence of sections of this paper, pretty much parallels the way this point of view developed in my own thinking. So to begin with, the first point I'd like to make, and I say this is the first point that occurred to me, developed in the sequence of thoughts in my life, there's no possibility contrary to what some philosophers have hoped for, of a rigorous demarcation between science and non-science. This is a big argument, especially between Sir Karl Popper and Rudolf Carnap. Uh, when I was a student and when I was a junior faculty member. But I realized a long time ago that there's no hope whatsoever of a clean-cut criterion of demarcation between science and non-science. For example, to the extent that there are maxims that apply to all of scientific inquiry, and I think there are, for example, make experiments. Or if that's impossible, make observations. And thus, of course, the inquiry is in pure logic or mathematics. Another maxim, which I don't see usually often stated in philosophy of science textbooks, is be meticulous. There's a lot of unsocialization of the science consists of drumming that maxim into one's head. 
submit, and this next one is one that John Dewey does mention, but it doesn't occur anywhere in Carnap's writing on inductive logic or in Popper's writing. Submit your work to the judgment of all who are competent in the area. Do not block, another famous pragmatist one, occurs in both Peirce and James, do not block the paths of inquiry, and I would add, or of discussion. Be fallibilistic. Well, these maxims apply to non-scientific inquiry as well. In fact, John Dewey, who stressed all of these maxims, thought that all properly conducted inquiry should be called scientific, but I think that was a mistake. We are stuck with a fuzzy distinction, even if the distinction does not mark an epistemological or metaphysical gulf. Now, I just employed the expression, a criterion of demarcation between science and non-science, an expression that's associated with the name of Karl Popper. And so I should admit that my discussion, of course, presupposes that Karl Popper's attempt to state such a criterion was a complete failure. Well, Popper's famous criterion was the difference between science and non-science is scientific theories imply testable predictions, in fact, imply predictions which are risky relative to background knowledge, and non-science does not. In technical jargon, scientific theories are falsifiable. Well, why do I say that this criterion is a complete failure? Well, for, for example, it excludes Darwin's theory of the origin of the species from the status of a scientific theory, and that's crazy. Uh, by the way, I should mention that Popper is rather late in his life tried to cover his tracks, but he never really gave up on that. The a little evidence, since many people are under the impression that Popper repudiated his own repudiation of the theory of evolution as not a scientific theory and metaphysics. Um, what happened is late in his life, Popper softened his rhetoric. For example, in a paper called Natural Selection and the Emergency of, Mo and the Emergence of Mind in 1978, he wrote, I still believe that natural selection works this way, that is, as a metaphysical research program. Nevertheless, I have changed my mind about the testability and the logical status of the theory of natural selection, and I am glad to make a recantation. So, so what's this uh, great recantation we're going to get? Popper's recantation was the statement that natural, the theory of natural selection was actually falsified. He was wrong in saying it was unfalsifiable because it was actually falsified. In order to make this astounding claim, Popper construed the theory of natural selection as claiming that, quote, everything that evolves is useful. You know, a misunderstanding that, of course, all the great evolutionary biologists have repeatedly denounced. And he still maintained, even with this misunderstanding, that the theory of that evolutionary biologists think of as the theory of evolution, which of course does not say that everything that evolves is useful, is not a scientific program at all, but quote, a most successful metaphysical research program. In his intellectual autobiography, Unended Quest, an intellectual autobiography, Popper repeats the claim that the theory of evolution is quote, not a testable scientific theory, unquote, and asserts that to the extent that it creates the impression that a ultimate explanation of the origin of the species has been found, quote, it is not so much better than the theistic view of adaptation. So, that's one reason for rejecting Popper's uh, criterion of demarcation. In a, in a paper in the volume, The Philosophy of Karl Popper, I believe to have shown that Popper's falsification criterion only pretends to account for the scientific status of Newtonian physics, and that Popper engages in an enormous amount of fabulation about the actual nature of Newtonian physics. And other proposals have not succeeded any more than, better than Popper's. 
But I'm also convinced that as ordinary people, we're not really troubled by the failure of whether philosophers come up or don't come up with, quote, criterion of demarcation. And we shouldn't be. We'll go on saying that physics is a science, in fact, our paradigm, and that chemistry is a science. More recently, we've all become convinced that evolutionary biology is a science. It collects data meticulously. It has a theory which impresses us. And it has close links with subjects like molecular biology, which resemble the paradigm, even if it itself does not. And we don't call, maybe I'm speaking tendentiously or persuasively here, we don't call history or sociology science, unless we're in the sociology department. <laughs> and we're pretty skeptical, or should be, about economics. <laughs> And this will go on being the case unless they have successes that impress us in the way in which physics and more recently biology have impressed us. The fact that it's fuzzy just what is and is not a science doesn't, however, mean that just anything can be called a science. And maybe this is a little bit of ordinary language philosophy, but not only do we not call history or sociology sciences, we certainly don't call textual interpretation or ethics sciences. But as I said, Science presupposes non-scientific knowledge. It was Rudolf Carnap's dream, my friend and my wife's PhD professor, for the last three decades of his life to try to show that science proceeds by a formal syntactic method. Today, to my knowledge, no one holds out any hope for that project. Karl Popper rejected Carnap's inductive logic but he too hoped to reduce the scientific method to a simple rule. Test all strongly falsifiable theories and retain the ones that survive. But that works no better than this Carnap's inductive logic. For when a theory conflicts with what has previously been supposed to be fact, we sometimes give up the theory and we sometimes give up the supposed fact, which is what Popper says we should never do. And as Quine famously put it, the decision of which to do is a matter of trade-offs that our point said we're rational, pragmatic. It's a matter of informal judgments of plausibility, simplicity, and the like. Nor is it the case that when two theories conflict, scientists do always wait until the observational data decides between them, as Papirian philosophy of science demands they should. An example I like to use in this connection is the following. It's a very little known example, recherche, but nice. Both Einstein's theory of gravitation, and this is the recherche part, Alfred North Whitehead's 1922 theory, of which very few people have even heard, agreed with special relativity and both predicted the familiar phenomena of the deflection of light by gravitation, the non-Newtonian character of the orbit of Mercury, the exact orbit of the moon, etc. Yet Einstein's theory was accepted and Whitehead's theory was rejected 50 years before anyone thought of an observation that would decide between the two. Indeed, a great many theories must be rejected on non-observational grounds. On well, seat of the pants grants, if you like. For the rule, test every theory that occurs to anyone is impossible to follow. As Bernowski once wrote to his friend Popper, you would not claim that scientists you would not claim that scientists test every falsifiable theory if as many crazy theories crossed your desk has crossed mine. <laughs> In short, judgments of coherence, simplicity, and the like are presupposed by physical science. Yet coherence and simplicity and the like are values. Indeed, each and every one of the arguments you've heard for relativism, or rad which I prefer to call radical contextualism and ethics, could be repeated in connection with these epistemic values, without the slightest alteration. The argument that ethical values, you've all, every one of us has heard, that ethical values are metaphysically queer because inter alia we don't have a sense organ for detecting goodness, 
could be modified to read, epistemic values are ontologically queer because we do not have a sense organ for detecting simplicity and coherence. The familiar arguments for relativism from the disagreements between cultures concerning values Arguments which are often driven by the fashionable, but I believe wholly untenable picture of different cultures as incommensurable. One recently uh, wonderfully bashed by the young American woman philosopher Michelle Moody Adams in a book called Fieldwork in Familiar Places. Uh, could be modified to read that there are disagreements between cultures concerning what beliefs are more coherent, plausible, simpler as a count of counts of the facts, etc. And in both of the cases, the case of ethics and the case of science, there are those who would say that when cultures disagree, saying that one side is objectively right is mere rhetoric. In fact, that's a dominant strain and at least the radical wing of what's called coming to be called postmodernism. Strain and at least the radical wing of what's with respect to this idea of the incommensurability of cultures, I cannot resist pointing out that when it comes to imperatives to abstain from pride and cruelty and hatred and oppression, you can find the same universalistic statements in ancient Egyptian literature that one hears today. For example, as Simone Weil wrote, there has never been a more moving definition of virtue than the word spoken in the Book of the Dead by the soul on the way to salvation. Lord of truth, I have brought truth to thee and I have destroyed wickedness for thee. I have not thought scorn of God. I have not brought forward my name for honors. I have not caused harm to be done to the servant by his master. I have made no one weak. I have not struck fear into any man. I have not spoken haughtily. I have not made myself deaf to the words of right and truth. That's in Simone Day's selected essays. And I have emphasized the fact that the familiar, that familiar arguments for relativism with respect to values would, if they were correct, apply to our epistemic values as well, because it's only by appreciating that fact that one can see just how self-refuting relativism actually is. Consider, for example, the views of Richard Rorty, uh, a well-known philosopher who holds that we should scrap the whole notion of an objective world, an objective truth, objective views, and speak of views which our culture would accept. Sometimes he adds, at its best. Now, the view that all there is to values, including the epistemic values, because Rorty does, is a clever enough man to appreciate that the arguments for relativism don't just apply to ethical values, they apply to justification, epistemic values, but the view that all there is to values, including the epistemic ones, is what our culture thinks, presupposes that at least some of our common sense claims can be accepted without philosophical reinterpretation. For example, talk of cultures, when does talk of cultures make sense? Well, what has to be in place before you can even understand talk of cultures is the idea of other people. The idea of other people as having beliefs. In short, the idea of a common world has to be in place. If Rorty were to say, and I did once get him to say this in public at a conference, by the way, but he doesn't say it in print. If Rorty were to say the talk of other people, is just marks and noises that help me cope, it would become obvious that his talk of the standards of our culture is empty by his own life. Common sense realism about the views of my cultural peers, coupled with anti-realism about everything else, makes no sense. If his word he likes to claim the notion of an objective world makes no sense, then the notion of our culture cannot be more than Rorty's private fantasy. And if there's no such thing as objective justification, not even of claims about what other people believe, then Rorty's talk of solidarity with the views of our culture is mere rhetoric. Rorty, of course, would agree with my claim that scientific inquiry presupposes that we take seriously claims that are not themselves scientific, 
including value claims of many kinds. He would simply say that we should give up the notion that there's such a thing as objectivity either in scientific or non-scientific inquiry. But at least some philosophers who want to hold on to the idea of scientific objectivity without admitting that science presupposes judgments which are not themselves scientific take a different tack. The only serious alternative, in fact, to admitting that the existence of warrantedly assertable claims as to matters that are non-scientific, that is, that they're warrantedly assertable claims as to what is more plausible than what, that they're warrantedly assertable claims as to what is more coherent than what, warrantedly assertable claims as to what is simpler than what. And the philosophers who wanted to deny that or, or want to deny that such claims are presupposed by the activity of gathering knowledge, even in the paradigm science of physics, often appeal to an epistemology proposed by the American philosopher Alvin Goldman. It's called reliableist epistemology. According, although actually it's a, a forerunner of that, was uh, my PhD professor, uh, Hans Reichenbach, in experience in prediction and his theory of probability. According to that epistemology, what makes a belief in science justified is that its acceptance was arrived at by a method which is reliable in the sense of having a high probability of resulting in the acceptance of true hypotheses. Now, technical objections have been made to this idea, and Goldman has made sophisticated alterations, sophisticated epicycles into the original formulation to meet the objections. But I don't want to get into these uh, technicalities. The grounds on which I would argue this approach does not succeed are more historical. To see why, let's consider the question, on what method was Einstein relying when he accepted the special and general theories of relativity? Now, we know Einstein's own answer. He tells us that he arrived at the special theory of relativity by applying an empiricist critique to the notion of simultaneity. By the way, he's asked, well, then why don't you apply, since you're troubled by quantum mechanics, why don't you apply an empiricist critique to the notions of quantum mechanics? By a friend, he wrote back, you know my view that Mach and Hume are wonderful medicine for getting rid of nonsense, but they can't give you anything positive. <laughs> um, and, he, and, we, and, and then having arrived at special relativity, he arrived at general relativity by seeking what he called the simplest theory of gravity compatible with special relativity in the infinitesimal domain. The um, difference between Einstein and Whitehead was over which was the simplest theory of gravity compatible with special relativity in the infinitesimal domain. <clears throat> By the way, if you want the details on Whitehead's theory, the refutation was the work of C.M. Will, uh, Relativistic Gravity in the Solar System II, and uh, in Astrophysics Journal uh, for 1971, page 409, it's <laughs> Now, the physicists who accepted these two theories regarded these as compelling considerations in their favor. But these two methods are completely topic-specific. So this is an aspect, by the way, of the thought of the 19th century philosopher of science, Comte, which is rarely mentioned. That Comte is usually regarded just as a protopositivist, with, in fact, in many ways, a founder of his history of science. And the argument, in fact, that each science develops its own specific topic, specific methods. That it's a mistake to look for the scientific method. <laughs> the, by a kind of lowest common denominator, method will not give you much. Uh, <clears throat> and moreover, both of these methods, since both Einstein and Whitehead thought they were applying the same second method, both of these methods presuppose judgments of reasonableness. And the entire physical community thought that Whitehead's way of applying it was unreasonable, although no one deduced a false prediction from Whitehead's theories, I say, till the 19th, 
uh, Wilkes paper in uh, 1971. And judgments of reasonableness just don't fall into classes to which it's feasible to apply judgments of probability. We can't apply numerical judgments of probability when we don't know what the reference class is. We don't have a probability space. We don't have a sample class. We don't have reliable statistics. I mean, this whole discussion is a replay of Reichenbach versus Ernest Nagel, circa around 1945-1949. Ernest Nagel's theory of probability rejects Reichenbach's reliabilism, which wasn't called that, on just this ground. In sum, not only is there no reason to think that the sorts of judgments I've been talking about, judgments of reasonableness, can be reduced to non-normative judgments, there is not a, even a serious sketch of such a reduction. Well, we come to objectivity, which, of course, is what everyone talks about. <laughs> the claim that judgments of fact presuppose judgments of value has been around at least since John Dewey. And if, and if you want to start reading Dewey, I, I like myself very much uh, Dewey and Tufts Ethics, which was the most widely used book in ethics in the United States until World War II and disappeared after World War II. It's a great shame because Dewey's ethics dealt with real problems like male chauvinism, racism, discusses Bolshevism in explaining why he rejects Bolshevism or communism. He says, you know, my disagreement with Marx isn't about class struggle. I believe in class struggle. Just I don't believe violence is going to make a better society. And moreover, I think the communists are confusing two things. They think that when you nationalize something, you socialized. And, you know, and after World War II, we got ethics books in which the typical ethical problem was about which you save when 25 children are drowning at the same time. And <laughs> so, I mean, something rather strange happened. But I also like uh, Dewey's book. Uh, if you want Dewey and see Dewey on both ethics and science, The Quest for Certainty is a wonderful book. Anyway. The fact that the claim that judgments of fact presuppose judgments of value makes one wonder why that claim has been ignored for so many decades. I think the real source of our difficulties is the crudity of the notions of objectivity that are so often brought to these discussions. Let's begin to, by thinking about how we judge objectivity when we're not trying to do metaphysics. Normally, we call and against the charge, oh, you are, what are you, an unreconstructed ordinary language philosopher? <laughs> it's like, well, when I first read Austin back in the late 50s, I wasn't convinced that philosophy ought to be about ordinary language, but I was sure convinced that good philosophy can be done in ordinary language. And when you consistently have to violate the way you normally understand the term, something is wrong with you, suspicious about your argument. <laughs> Well, how do we normally judge objectivity? I mean, normally we ask things, questions like this. Is the statement being made from an idiosyncratic standpoint? Is the person making the statement showing due regard for other relevant interests and standpoints? Uh, now, a sufficient condition that an ethical claim be objective in its ordinary sense is that it be reasonable from the standpoint of an interest in the common welfare where the common welfare need not be thought of as something already handed down. The alternative possibility is to think of the common welfare as something that we agree to be determined by intelligent discussion among the persons who share this very commitment. I want to emphasize this is something that I suggest only as a sufficient condition and by no means a necessary one. Value judgments are not a homogenous class and are different sorts of objectivity. But I will concentrate on ethical claims of this kind, sometimes called claims about the common welfare, sometimes called claims in political ethics or claims in social ethics. If an ethical claim of this sort is accepted by those affected at the end of experimentation and intelligent discussion, then it will be what John Dewey called a warrantedly assertable claim, as long as reasons to question it do not arise. And the similarity, and I want to stress the similarity between asking the question, 
what beliefs are acceptable from the standpoint of persons who are, one, concerned to be able to justify their beliefs to other persons, and two, to do so by appeal to standards that other persons who share that very concern cannot reasonably reject. That's the question we ask, for example, when we do science. And the questions, what actions are justifiable from the standpoint of persons who are concerned to be able to justify their actions to other persons and to do so by appeal to standards that other persons who share that very concern cannot reasonably reject the question we ask when we do social ethics. These concerns, like the concern with cognitive values and the concern with ethical values in general, presuppose one another. But this is not the way philosophers nowadays are thinking of objectivity. More often than not, I run into philosophers who tend to define objective by phrases like, and I'm quoting from recent papers, reality has an existence and character wholly independent of human practices, beliefs, and evidence or, quotes, something being the case is independent of how anyone would regard it. Such definitions are philosophers' blinkers rather than workable conceptions. In fact, it seems to me that in contrast with the ordinary use of the word objective I described before, objective seems to be used by philosophers today somewhat as cognitively meaningful used to be used like by logical positivists as a term for claims which really metaphysically or ontology have a truth value. But the definitions I just quoted are failures in their own terms, in metaphysical realist terms. For example, with regard to something's being the case is independent of how anyone would regard it. Haven't these philosophers noticed that reality does not have a ca an existence and character wholly independent of human practices, beliefs, and evidence? Is it the case that human practices, beliefs, and evidence are a very large part of the reality we talk about and that reality would be quite different where they differ? Well, perhaps causal independence is not what is meant. And I don't know what is meant. Metaphysical realists often insist that a truly objective statement is one whose truth has, quotes, no connection with warranted assertability, actual or possible. But this, too, is just a philosophical shibboleth, because there are many statements for which truth is conceptually connected to warranted assertability under appropriate conditions. And these include many statements which metaphysical realists would class as objective that there are mountains in the area bounded by 70 degrees west and 75 degrees west and by 40 degrees north and 45 degrees north is an objective fact, if anything is. But given that it's part of the concept of a mountain, that mountains are big enough to see, it necessarily follows that if there are mountains in that area and if appropriate conditions exist, people who know their own latitude and longitude are there to see them, and there's nothing to interfere with their seeing the mountains, etc., it will be warrantedly assertable that there are mountains in the area in question. Perhaps conceptual independence is not what is meant either. I think it's no accident that metaphysical realists never do tell us what they mean by independent. That in such a case, my mountains case, and in the case of most ordinary statements about observable things, there are people in this room, for example, truth, realist truth, if you please, and warranted assertability under appropriate conditions coincide is no accident. To understand the claim that there's a mountain in a certain place, I must know what a mountain is. And normally this means knowing what mountains would look like. Grasp of the content of the claim and grasp of its verification conditions are conceptually related for many claims, even if they're not the same. Moreover, such extreme requirements for objectivity as total independence from what human beings could do or could know or believe are irrelevant to ethics from the start. No ethicist except a rampant Platonist, and I myself sometimes wonder whether Plato was a rampant Platonist, would say that what is, whether it is a rampant Platonist, would say that what is right and wrong is independent of human nature. Or more particularly, no ethicist would say that what's right and wrong is totally independent of how human beings who are raised in a community with a moral tradition would regard things, or very few ethicists would. 
Certainly Aristotle did not hold that what is right for human beings to do or right for them to be is, quote, independent of how human beings would regard it in any and all convinced circumstances. He constantly appeals in his ethics the facts about how human beings would regard things. Yet it's decidedly odd to suppose that the sort of objectivity Aristotle sees ethical statements as having, which as he says at the beginning, is different from the kind of objectivity that statements in geometry have. But to say that Aristotle was not a realist in ethics uh, would be decidedly odd, or not a cognitivist. For these and other reasons too numerous to go into now, I find the attempt to force us to classify our beliefs as objective or subjective, and then the assumptions that get made tacitly usually about which beliefs are which, and made tacitly or explicitly about what follows if a belief is put in this box or in this box, decidedly objectionable. Usually philosophy suffers at any given period from this problem of too few boxes. I mean, when I started my, the work, you know, that really led to my career, the first paper in which I found my own voice, the analytic and the synthetic, was stimulated really by a suggestion by another junior faculty member, Sylvan Baumberger, that you have too few boxes. <laughs> a pressing task for philosophy, as I see it, is to challenge these classifications so that we may see the terrain without the distortions which they produce. Classifications so that we may see the terrain without the distortions which they produce. How are objective ethical claims possible? Well, by now, I hope to have convinced you that the denial of the very possibility of objective value claims threatens to turn into a denial of the very possibility of a reasonable, ordinary language sort of objectivity. But I know this will not shake the confidence in the fact-value dichotomy of people who have seen to come to see that dichotomy as inseparable from modern scientific sophistication. I believe that the first person, he was a great thinker and a great human being, to eloquently defend the idea that we have to give up the idea that there can be value objectivity was Max Weber uh, in science, in his science as a vocation. Uh, he said in, in an elegiac and regretful tone that we are, quote, we moderns are, quote, committed to a pluralism, to a polytheism of ultimate values. Um, but I believe, although I have enormous respect for Weber, that he was wrong. Uh, such people may agree, people, that we should not think of objectivity in the way in which metaphysical realists think of it. Weber certainly would have. But they don't see how value judgments in ethics can have any sort of objectivity at all. In their view, acceptance of the fact that value dichotomy is part of the epistemology that goes with modern science. I think Weber's case, there was another reason, which is he was constantly torn about whether he should leave his wife for his mistress or stay with his wife. And I think part of the, the subtext in, in science of vocation is that Kant's ethics can't help me make that decision. <laughs> However, <laughs> this I learned from Dan Bell. <laughs> um, I've already alluded to the crudest of the epistemological defenses of the fact-value dichotomy, which runs like this. How can there be objective ethical values? We can say how we detect yellow, we have eyes. But what sense organs do we have for detecting value? What makes that crude is this naivete about perception. Perception of, perceptions of yellow may indeed be pretty minimally conceptually informed. I tend to think they're more conceptually informed than, say, Chris Peacock does, but it's a hard question. But consider the parallel question. How could we come to tell that people are elated? After all, we have no sense organ for detecting elation. We can tell that other people are elated, and sometimes we can even see that other people are elated. In fact, in the case of elation, more often than not. But we can do so only after we've acquired the concept of elation. Perception is not innocent. It's an exercise of our concepts, an exercise of what Kant called our spontaneity. Once I have acquired the concept of elation, I can see that someone is elated. And similarly, once I've acquired the concept of a friendly person, 
I can see sometimes that someone is friendly. Of a malicious person, I can see that someone is malicious. Of a kind person, I can see that someone is kind. To be sure, such judgments are fallible. But the idea that because they're fallible, they must really be inferences from some other judgments which are infallible is a move that philosophers have long given up making. As pragmatists in particular have never believed in infallibility, either in perception or anywhere else. As Peirce once put it, in science we don't have a firm foundation, and we don't need one. We're on swampy ground, but that's what keeps us moving. If you take one thing home from this talk, take that one. <laughs> Connected with the idea that to know that there are values, we would need to have a special sense organ, is the old empiricist psychology, according to which perceptual experience is value neutral as opposed to emotion, and values are added to experience by projection. In a variant of this idea, notice all these ideas depend on the idea of separate, non interpenetrating mental faculties. Uh, perception supplies reason with neutral facts, and value comes from the will. Now, this empiricist psychology has been sharply criticized by a number of authors, one of the best, one of the best being Iris Murdoch in her early philosophical books. And the American pragmatists in particular have always emphasized that experience is a neutral. It comes to a screening with values. In infancy, we experience food and drink and cuddling and warmth as good, and pain and deprivation and loneliness as bad. And as our experiences multiply and become more sophisticated, the tinges and shades of value also multiply and become more sophisticated. Think, for example, of a wine taster's description of an Australian wine. A little peach. <laughs> and maybe some pepto um, However, the pragmatists do not make the error of supposing that merely being valued as a, as a matter of experiential fact suffices to make something valuable. No distinction is more insistent in John Dewey's writing than the distinction between the valued and the valuable. You'll find that one in the quest for certainty as elsewhere. Between the desired and the desirable. Dewey's answer to the question, well, what makes something valuable as opposed to merely being valued, in a word, is criticism. Objective value arises not from a special sense organ, but from the criticism of our valuings. Valuings are incessant and inseparable from all of our activities, including our scientific ones, but it is by intelligent reflection on our valuings, intelligent reflection of the kind that Dewey calls criticism, that we conclude that some of them are warranted while others are unwarranted. Philosophy is described by Dewey as criticism of criticism. But this leads to the next question. By what criteria do we decide that some valuings are warranted and some unwarranted? With this question, we enter more sophisticated levels of the epistemological issue. What I shall present, as I have been doing, is John Dewey's answer, which is convenient to divide into three parts. One, in judging the outcome of an inquiry, whether it be an inquiry into what are conventionally called facts, or to what are conventionally considered to be values, we always bring to bear a large stock of both valuations and descriptions which are not in question in that inquiry. We're never in the position imagined by the positivists of having a large stock of factual beliefs and no value judgments, and of having to decide whether our very first value judgment is warranted. We're never in the position of having to infer our very first ought from a whole lot of isms. Two, we neither have nor require one single criterion, as the question suggests, for judging warranted assertability in ethics any more than we do in any other area. I should say in ethics any more than in science. In particular, the authority of philosophy is not the authority of a field vested with knowledge or pretended knowledge of such a criterion or set of criteria. As Dewey himself put it, as philosophy has no private store of knowledge of, or methods for attaining truth, so it has no private access to good. 
as it accepts knowledge and principles from those competent in science and inquiry, it accepts the goods that are diffused in human experience. It has no Mosaic or Pauline authority of revelation entrusted to it, but it has the authority of intelligence, of criticism of these common and natural goods. Three, with the appearance of the term intelligence, we come to the last part of Dewey's answer to the by what criteria question. If Dewey does not believe that inquiry requires criteria in the sense of decision procedures or algorithms, either in the sciences or in daily life, he does believe that there are some things we have learned about inquiry from the conduct of inquiry. In our writing on Dewey, Ruth Anna Putnam and I have insisted that if one thing distinguishes Dewey as a as the strong meta-ethicist, then from him the distinction collapses, it is his emphasis on the importance of and his consistent application of the idea that what holds good for inquiry in general holds for value inquiry in particular. But what does hold good for inquiry in general? We've learned Deweyans insist that inquiry, which is to make full use of human intelligence, has to have certain characteristics, including the characteristics which I've elsewhere referred to by the phrase the democratization of inquiry. And I'm happy to acknowledge the influence of Jürgen Habermas in that phrase, as well as the Dewey. For example, intelligent inquiry obeys the principles of what Habermas calls discourse ethics. It does not block the path of inquiry by preventing the raising of questions and objections, nor obstruct the formulation of hypotheses and criticism of the hypotheses of others. At its best, it avoids relations of hierarchy and dependence. It insists upon experimentation where possible and observation and close analysis of observation where experiment is impossible. By appeal to these and kindred standards, we can often tell that views are irresponsibly defended in ethics as well as in science. Not everyone will be convinced, I know. Some of the undergraduates in a class I taught last year suggested that belief in giving reasons and actually observing how various ways of life have functioned in practice, what the consequences have been, discussing objections, etc., is, quote, just another form of fundamentalism. The experience of these students with real fundamentalism must be rather limited. <laughs> Anyone who's seen real fundamentalists in action knows the difference between insisting on observation and discussion and the repressive and suppressive mode of conducting the discussion that is characteristic of fundamentalism. But in any case, I think that this objection was both anticipated and adequately responded to by the founder of pragmatism, Charles Sanders Peirce, in his famous essay, The Fixation of Belief. The discovery that inquiry, which is to be successful in the long run, of course, observation and experimentation and public discussion of the results of that observation and experimentation is not something a priori, but is itself something that we learn from observation and experimentation with different methods of conducting inquiry. Such methods and the failure of such methods as the method of tenacity, the method of a folk just stick to what daddy and granddaddy and granddaddy and so on always believes the method of authority, and the method of appeal to allegedly a priori reason. Well, it's time to conclude. I said at the outset that the distinction between science and non-scientific knowledge is fuzzy. But even the two cases that I've considered, in this talk I've considered what I will call the science-related case, that is choosing between theories in advance of any crucial experiment, or when a crucial experiment is not possible, or as far as we know not possible, and the case of social ethics. Even these two cases illustrate one aspect of the distinction between scientific and non-scientific knowledge. While judgments of reasonableness, coherence, plausibility, simplicity, and the like, are presupposed by science, they're not often thematized by science. Whereas in the non-scientific case, they are likely to be the explicit subject matter of our controversies and discussions. Textbooks of physics do not very often contain statements to the effect that one theory is more reasonable than another, although in periods of scientific revolution they may. Whereas essays on ethical and political questions constantly contain claims of this sort. 
I argue that judgments of reasonableness can be objective. That does not mean they're totally independent of what human beings can know and do. Reasonableness means reasonableness for human beings, and invariably for human beings in a particular context. On the, on the other hand, the view that there's no more to reasonableness than what one's particular culture believes leads immediately to paradox. For since our own culture does not believe that cultural relativism is correct as a general view of truth and justification, it follows from cultural relativism itself that cultural relativism is neither true nor justified. Gordy, of course, hopes to change this point, this state of affairs, which is awkward from his point of view. But I don't think he will succeed. In brief, reasonableness is relative to context, including culture, but not simply what a culture takes to be reasonable. Also, I've argued in various books and papers, and again in good pragmatist fashion, that the fact we cannot reduce reasonableness to an algorithm does not mean a computer program does not mean we cannot say a good deal about it. Some of you may have noticed that the kind of objectivity I claim for one sort of ethical claim was objectivity from within the ethical life. I did not deal with the vexed issue of whether there's a sense in which the choice of the ethical life itself is, quote, subjectively right. My own view is that there is, but that's not an issue I needed to discuss for my purposes tonight. In this respect, my strategy tonight follow the so-called constructivist strategy of John Rawls and Thomas Scanlon. I mentioned at the outset that I've been writing and lecturing about these topics for over two decades. There's one topic that I've invariably discussed in my courses, which has not yet entered into my discussion tonight, and I want to close by rectifying that omission. In my courses, I've always discussed at some length the curious fashion in which recent disputes about the objectivity of meaning facts, uh, for example, Quine's famous claim that uh, translation and reference are indeterminate. Discussions of that claim exactly parallel the older disputes about the objectivity of value claims, particularly of ethical claims. <clears throat> In, incidentally, in Bernard Williams' book, Descartes, they are explicitly linked. <laughs> Interestingly, almost every move that's ever been made in the dispute over ethics has been repeated in the dispute over Quine's claim that there are no meaning facts. Now, I have in my course, Non-Sided Acknowledge, I have the students read Quine on the indeterminacy of translation, and then Williams and others on ethics. For example, corresponding to the utilitarian attempt to give ethics objectivity by reducing ethical claims to natural scientific claims, e.g. claims about pleasure, which the utilitarian thought of as something we'd eventually be able to measure. And there are the attempts by such philosophers as Fredretsky and Jerry Fodor to reduce meaning claims to claims about causal pro probabilistic covariation. There's a good uh, review in that literature in the uh, new uh, Blackwell's Companion to the Philosophy of Language, by the way, the article by Terence Horgan on naturalizing semantics. Um, the idea is that in some way the fact that the word cat refers to cats can be, is supposed to be reduced to the alleged facts that tokenings of the word cat co-vary with occurrences of cats. <clears throat> And corresponding to the non-cognitive strategy of denying that there's such a thing as an ethical fact, there's the Quinean strategy of denying that there's any such thing as a meaning fact. Ethical claims are just expressions of feeling according to the emotivist. Meaning claims are just expressions of a decision to translate a discourse one way rather than another, a decision which may be convenient or inconvenient but not scientifically right or wrong for Quine. Of course, Quine also believes there are no ethical facts, and he's expressed skepticism about confirmation, that is, the objectivity of scientific justification. What keeps him from postmodernism is only his positivist faith in prediction as the sole touchstone of objectivity. In sum, if ethical questions are not the subject matter of a so-called mature science, they've got a surprising number of companions in the guilt. Justification, coherence, simplicity, and now meaning and reference 
all exhibit the same problems that ethical predicates do from an epistemological and metaphysical point of view. Nor is this something to be wondered at. For like ethical predicates, all of them have to do with reasonableness, reasonableness in action, in belief, and in interpretation. And it is the refusal to tolerate any sort of objectivity that is not underwritten by a grand metaphysical narrative that leads to the corrosive skepticism that we find with respect to each of them in at least some fashionable quarters today. In this respect, in spite of all its attack on grand metaphysical narratives, Postmodernism is often just the skeptical face of the metaphysical itch. In 1982, I published a paper called Beyond the Fact-Value Dichotomy that I read to the first meeting of my course, Non-Scientific Knowledge, each time I give the class. It has become, so to speak, by manifesto, and I shall close with a few sentences adapted from it. It's reprinted my book, Realism with Human Face, by the way. Where are we then? On the one hand, the idea that science, in the sense of exact science, exhausts rationality is seen to be a self saltifying error. The very activity of arguing about the nature of rationality presupposes a notion of rationality wider than that of laboratory testability. If there's no fact of the matter about what cannot be tested by deriving predictions, then there's no fact of the matter about any philosophical statement, including that one. On the other hand, any conception of rationality broad enough to embrace philosophy, not to mention linguistics, mentalistic psychology, history, clinical psychology, etc., must embrace much that is vague, ill-defined, and no more capable of being scientized than was the knowledge of our ancestors. The horror of what cannot be methodized is nothing but method fetishism. It is time we got over it. Getting over it would reduce our intellectual hubris. We might even recover our sense of mystery. Who knows? Thank you. <laughs>
believing that there are a lot of churches in Vienna. Uh, the view that I was in fact attracted to was that these are I, uh, identical in 1960 was that these are identical with states of the brain or the brain and central nervous system. Uh, but I, in my the machines, although that was the view I was most attracted to, I suggested but did not adopt a different view. That was the first proposal of this functionalist debate would have been perhaps better to call it a computationalist view, although uh, learned that there was an earlier view in the philosophy of mind called functionalism due to John Dewey, which I probably still agree with, by the way, because Dewey is one of my heroes, as you know from the last lecture. Uh, that's maybe a reason to keep the word functionalism. Anyway, um, I should say, since I've learned the name is bashing functionalism, that there's a broad sense, a non-technical sense, in which I'm still a functionalist, even if I'm not one in the technical sense that I will go on to explain. Uh, I feel functionalism in the sense in which I think Aristotle was a functionalist, as I think of mental states, like thinking there are a lot of churches in Vienna, uh, perceiving uh, a bottle of water on the table, uh, wanting some of that great Australian wine, uh, uh, being amused at the notion of a inappropriate relationship. <laughs> uh, I think of mental states as functions of an organism that are realized in and through matter. I will primarily be defending or elaborating that positive in these lectures, but this sort of Aristotelian hylomorphism uh, still is the, is the way I view things, and uh, what I've given up, however, is a kind of functionalism that might better be called computationalism, like the idea that these functions can be described using uh, language from the field of logic in which I did a great deal of my work, namely the theory of computation and my logical work. Functionalism, in this narrower sense, uh, was viewed up as automata. That is, the, my idea was that we're computers that happen to be made of flesh and blood. So according to this view, a robot with the same program as a human being would, if so facto, be conscious. I guess I still believe that, actually. I mean, anyone who's seen Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> any right-thinking person who's seen Star Trek ought to believe that. <laughs> uh, but moreover, the individual mental, the, but the key idea that I'll be repudiating was the idea that individual mental states can be identified with, are, are the states that would figure in an ideal description of our brains or of us in software terms, that these are to be described as our programs or as functions, mathematical functions of our programs. It may well be that the brain is a computer or that it's useful to idealize it as a computer. I, I don't think that that's uh, something that we're, we're required to believe by modern science. I think that's still uh, somewhat of an open question, but at the moment it's perhaps one of the most useful ways of thinking about the brain we have. But it doesn't follow from that. But I don't. Uh, but the description of the, but the idea that my description as a person can be simply read off from the description of my brain is something that I will be calling into question in these last four lectures in a major way. I'll be not only criticizing identity theory, I'll be criticizing something that I took for granted and that almost all philosophers in the world, except hardcore dualists, took for granted for centuries, namely that it makes sense to talk of the brain state correlated with a given vernacular psychological state. I'll be arguing not that uh, we have immaterial souls that will be incompatible with my Aristotelian hylomorphism, but that this talk of correlation 
actually makes no sense. This is a case where we've uh, swallowed something that's clear, which is anything but clear, but that's getting ahead in the story. Anyway, so although in 1960, I only put forward as an interesting hypothesis the idea that our mental states are our computational states. I call them, in minds and machines, I call them our logical states. Uh, in a talk I gave to the American, uh, uh, in subsequent years, let me, I'm getting ahead of the story, by, 19, by, by the 1970s I had adopted that hypothesis and was arguing for it vigorously. But there was an in-between in period which is w worth talking about. I mentioned that I published a paper, it was given as a talk to the American Philosophical Association in 1964 called Robots, colon, Machines or Artificially Created Life. Uh, now, I think I made an interesting mistake in that paper in discovering that it was a mistake that created a stage for what I'm going to talk about. Forgive this autobiographical style, but I find it often easiest when I want to talk about large parts of my work and not simply hone in on one argument to do things autobiographically. Uh, I considered the, the view that I just attributed to functionalism, the view that I said I still think is correct, namely that if you had a robot whose uh, positronic brain, if anybody read Isaac Asimov here, uh, functioned in a way isomorphic to the way the human brain functions, or sufficiently close to isomorphic, then it too would be conscious. But in the 1964 paper, I drew back from that view. Instead, I argued at the end that the question whether any automaton, no matter how it behaved, was conscious, was not really a question of fact, but I said it depends on a decision on our part, a decision, to, and as I put it, quote, to treat robots of, as fellow members of our linguistic community, unquote. So when I came to write the, two the other two papers, two later papers, namely The Nature of Mental States uh, and, oh, and The Mental Life of Some Machines, these two papers I would describe as functionalist manifestos or computationalist manifestos. When I came to write those functionalist manifestos, uh, I had changed my view. I decided that the question as to whether both questions, the question as to whether robots could be conscious and the question as to whether psychological states are really computational in nature, functional in that sense, uh, to be factual questions. I had seen that the earlier talk contained an error. In the 1964 paper, I assumed that if an identity theory a theory of the fact that psychological states are identical with brain states or with functional states were true, then it would have to be true by virtue of two things. The conjunct one, the meanings of the psychological words, and two, empirical facts that do not themselves beg the question as to whether robots could be conscious. But by 1967, I've come to see that the same line of reasoning, if you applied it to the question whether light is electromagnetic radiation, or light or electromagnetic radiation of certain wavelengths, that you'd come, you would be forced to con the conclusion that that too is not a question of fact, but called for a decision on our part, a decision to treat electromagnetic radiation as light. For after all, persons who knowing what we do about the causes and effects of electromagnetic radiation, if there were any such persons who insisted that light is not identical with electromagnetic radiation, but only correlated with the presence of such radiation, they wouldn't be contradicting themselves. That light is electromagnetic radiation does not follow analytically, as philosophers say, that is, by the very meaning of the words from non, so-called non-question-begging facts about electromagnetic radiation and about light. I now realize that it's wrong to insist that statements that make 
identifications, as a matter of scientific theory, call them theoretical identifications, of phenomena that we originally described in different vocabularies have to follow analytically from, quote, non-question begging facts in order to be true. If we want to claim that light is electromagnetic radiation, we need only maintain that it's rational to believe that it is, given what we now know. The question of analyticity is a red herring. Thus, I was led to drop my concern with analyticity entirely and return to an earlier view of mine, namely that to return to the notion of theoretical identification and with it to a notion that I now introduce to go with the notion of theoretical identification, the notion of synthetic identity of properties. But it's a little technical, but we need this in order because I will be dealing with modern uh, materialist views of the mind-body relation and these all need this sort of apparatus or related apparatus. I spoke of synthetic identity of properties because in the papers I published after the late 60s, I said that not only is light passing through an aperture the same event as electromagnetic radiation passing through the aperture, I said the property of being light is the very same property as the property of being electromagnetic radiation of such and such wavelengths. Okay. So there you have receiver. Here is light passing through an aperture A. So the first thing I say is there are two events there, the light passing through A and the electromagnetic radiation passing through A. They are one and the same event. The events are identical. Moreover, the property of being light, I say, is just the property of being electromagnetic radiation of certain wavelengths. So that, so I insist to say that there's an event identity and a property identity, and that both identities are synthetic, that, that is contingent, empirical, not matters of conceptual analysis. In short, I held and still hold that properties can be contingently identical, and the way in which we establish that properties are contingently identical, synthetically identical, is by showing that identifying them simplifies our explanatory endeavors in certain familiar ways. Now, in my earliest paper on the issue of minds and machines, the theoretical identification that I predicted we might make in 200 years, I said, was the, an identification of human psychological states with the assumed corresponding brain state. At that point, I still thought it makes sense to speak of the brain state corresponding to a given psychological state. Also, I assumed in the paper that we might think of psychological states as more analogous to what I dare call logical states of machines, states defined at the programming level, than to structural states of machines, states defined at the hardware level, thereby introducing functionalism as an option. As I said, I did not follow up the option at the time, but after uh, 67, I took up the option with a vengeance and suggested that just as light, particularly in the paper called The Nature of Mental States, that just as light is empirically identical with electromagnetic radiation, so I proposed as a hypothesis, psychological states are empirically identical with functional states. Here is the hypothesis as I stated it in The Nature of Mental States. For the sake of simplicity, I stated it only for the case of pain, but I made clear that pain was only an example. Something like this was supposed to hold for psychological states in general. So, as we see, functionalism asserts that psychological properties, and states are just the kind of property, a pro or strictly speaking, a relation, a relation between an object and a time. But psychological properties, states are empirically identical with functional states, that is, with computational states. And as stated in the nature of mental states, using pain as an example, that means, and I'll have to show you the next transparency because it's 
I can only fit the, the beginning of here. One, all organisms capable of feeling pain are probabilistic automata. This is a kind of computer, a model, abstract computer, and we'll say a little more later about exactly what that is. For those of you who know what a Turing machine is, uh, this is not the way a probabilistic automata is defined, but something equivalent to the notion. You get something equivalent to the notion of a probabilistic automata if you take a Turing machine Instead of assuming that the tape is potentially infinite, that is, that more tape can be always be spliced on if it needs more memory, put a finite upper bound on the length of the tape. Spliced on if it needs more memory. The first principle of functionalism is that every organism is capable of feeling pain or whatever the psychological state in question may be. Possess is a probabilistic automata, and that's implied already by the second thing as well, with some redundancy in these axioms. Every organism capable of feeling pain possesses at least one probabilistic description of a certain kind K. That is, being capable of feeling pain just is possessing a description of a certain kind. Two, three, no organism capable of feeling pain possesses a decomposition into parts which separately possess the description of kind K. So that means that Australia and the United States do not literally feel pain uh, because they have a decomposition into parts which separately feel pain. Uh, this is, by the way, three, if you take that to mean a decomposition of parts, at least one of which, then that would rule out Searle's Chinese room, which was proposed much later. For, for every probabilistic automaton description of the relevant kind K, there exists a subset of the sensory input. So these are not, these, the probabilistic automata I'm, I'm talking about are not supposed to be pure automata, automata with no sense organs. They are supposed to be automata with mechanical sense organs of some kind and mechanical motor organs, which means that among the things they can do is except things that are printed on the tape by the sense organs or print on a second tape which instructs motor organs. For every probabilistic automaton description of kind K, there exists a subset of the sensory inputs such that an organism with that description is in pain if and only if its inputs are in that subset. So to summarize, a human being or an animal or any animal, or this is of course uh, Pain is a statement we ascribe to organisms much simpler than humans, organisms with virtually no brains at all. But to be an organism capable of feeling pain or a robot capable of feeling pain, you have to have at least a certain kind, which is not specified here, notice, of description. There's some set of descriptions, perhaps an infinite set of descriptions, so that one of those has to be your probabilistic automaton description. And to be in pain, to be capable of feeling pain, is just to have a description of that kind. And to actually be in pain is to have a description of that kind and to have a sensory input in an appropriate subset. Now, I admitted that the hypothesis was very vague. I and mean, what's the kind K? Could be an infinite class of descriptions. Is it a definable class? Is it specifiable in non-intentional terms and specifiable otherwise than just as the set of descriptions such that something with that description is capable of feeling pain. I admitted that the hypothesis was very vague, but I argue that, quote, in spite of its admitted vagueness, it is far less vague than the physical chemical state hypothesis today and far more susceptible to investigation of both a mathematical and an empirical kind, close quotes. And then, and then I added, and this reveals the extent of what I would call my scientism at that time, quote, indeed, to investigate this hypothesis is just to attempt to produce mechanical models of organisms. And isn't this, in a sense, just what psychology is all about? The difficult step, of course, I'm still reading from this manifesto, the difficult step, of course, will be to pass your models of specific organisms to a normal form for the psychological description of organisms. For this is what is required to make 
2 and 4 precise. But this too seems to be an inevitable part of the program of psychology. Close quotes. In a paper that ended up being published in the same year, The Mental Life of Some Machines, in that paper I closed by allowing that while the functional organization of a Turing machine or probabilistic automaton is given by something called the machine table, the description of the functional organization of a human being, quotes, might well be something different and more complicated, end quotes. But like the paper from which I just quoted, I did not doubt that the very raison d'etre of psychology is to produce mechanical models of organisms. Nor does that paper express any reservations about the idea that it is, quote, an inevitable part of the program of psychology, unquote to provide a normal form for the psychological description of organisms. Not just for the psychological description of human beings, please note, as if that were not utopian enough, but a normal form for the psychological description of an arbitrary organism. Once psychology has progressed far enough in the pursuit of this, quote, inevitable program, to make the hypothesis that mental states are just functional states precise, it will be possible, or so I claimed, to confirm the hypothesis in a way analogous to the way in which we have confirmed theoretical identifications in physics. The laws of unreduced psychology, vernacular psychology, to the extent that they are true, will be explained by the fact that the psychological states they speak of are really these functional states, just as the laws of optics, unreduced optics, to the extent that they were true, were explained by the fact that the light rays and light waves they spoke of were really electromagnetic radiation of certain wavelengths. Well, let's now, as I say, the idea that we literally are Turing machines, which was the or probabilistic automata, which is the way in which I originally proposed functionalism, uh, quickly came to seem untenable. And at the beginning of philosophy and our mental life, I expanded on my qualms about supposing that psychological states of human beings are literally Turing machine states. In these papers, I frequently spoke generally of Turing machines rather than more precisely of probabilistic automata. I recognized that, quote, the difficulty with the notion of psychological isomorphism is that it presupposes a notion of something's being a functional or psychological description. And I went on to say that it's for that reason that in my previous papers I explained the notion in terms of Turing machines. And I remarked that that was the reason I felt constrained to defend the idea that we are Turing machines. Turing machines, I explained, come with a normal form for their functional description, the machine table, a standard style of program. Here's a one possible, very simple explanation of what a Turing machine is. Turing machine, and the name comes, with, this was invented by Alan Turing, after whom Turing machines are named, have, but first of all, they have a finite number of states. And they say, secondly, they have a tape divided into separate squares. And there it is. In addition, the machine has a scanning head. And at any one time, the machine is scanning exactly one square. There's the scanning head. So the tape can be moved either left or right one square at a time, which has the effect of causing the scanning head to either scan the, the next square to the right or the next square to the left of whichever square it's scanning at a given stage. It, it moves in discrete stages, so it, it also has the option depending on instructions, of not moving. So that so the tape at a given stage is scanning a particular square, as you see here. Then at the next stage, it may still be scanning that same square. Or it may now be scanning this square. You can either think of a scanning head is moving, or more easily of the tape is shifting. Or at the next stage, it may be scanning this square. And of course, there are symbols, typically symbols. We count blank space always as a symbol. There are 
symbols written on the tape. At the beginning of a computation, typically there'll be a finite number of symbols written on the tape. And the, uh, you might think of the computation as beginning always with the scanning head scanning the first symbol in the list of symbols that are originally printed on the tape. So you might have something like this on the tape. Think of these as a rather primitive notation for numbers. A single one means one, three tallies means three. So this says one plus three. And the machine has just was started by scanning this one and then it moved right one and it's now scanning this plus and thinking about what to do. So in addition to having, for any given Turing machine, you have a tape, you have a scanning head, you have a symbol from a finite, al you have symbols from a finite alphabet, and one of those, including blank space, may be printed, and exactly one may be printed in each square. And apart from the, apart from the symbols which were typed onto the tape by the operator when he set the problem, when the machine is actually running, further printing can only be done on the square which the scanning head is scanning. So for example, one way in which this machine might operate, I'll give you a program for doing that in a minute, is if it's scanning this plus and in the appropriate state, it might erase that plus and print a one instead. And then when it's done that, it might then go into state and show this go back to the beginning so it finds a blank and then move back so now to identify the beginning of the string and erase this one and then go into a rest state, a state in which nothing happens ever. That would, have, that would be one way of adding. And in fact, here's a program for doing that, exactly that way. Uh, the, the key point is the Turing machine is completely described by a machine table. Now, there's like some confusion with mathematicians often think of the Turing machine as the table, which makes the machine an abstract object. I prefer to think, and this was Turing's intention, of a Turing machine is a concrete realization of the machine table. But of course, from a mathematical point of view, machines that have the same machine table on them are identical. So here's a sample machine table. It's, it's, a, it's a table for doing exactly what I just described, for adding in this uh, rather primitive notation. So you see here, you have three symbols, which are called S1, S2, S3. Notice that the machine table has as many rows as there are symbols in the alphabet. That's always finite. And one of them is always the blank space. And it has many columns as there are states, as, 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 as uh, the machine is supposed to have computationally relevant states. So this machine, the machine with this table, is supposed to have four computationally relevant states, of which the fourth one, D, is a rest state. You can tell it's a rest state because you notice C here means continue scanning the same square. The fact that you have a C in every instruction in this column means that if the machine is ever in state D, if the machine is in state D, it stays in state D, no matter what it's scanning. If it's, if it's scanning a symbol S1, which is the first symbol to one, it prints an S1, which has the effect of not changing what was on the tape. It continues scanning the same square, and it stays in state D. If it's scanning S2, it prints S2, which is to say it doesn't change anything. It doesn't move left or right. It's center, C for center, and it stays in state D. If it's scanning S3, again, it prints S3, which doesn't change anything. It centers, which doesn't change anything, and stays in the same state. So D is a dead state. If you ever get into state D, you never get out of it, and you never do anything. It's the rest state, as the name implies. Now, the other states are the active states. If the machine is started scanning a 1, and in state A, which is the state we imagine the state being in whenever it starts a computation, it goes right one square and stays in state A. So if it hits another one, it'll leave, the, it'll print that one back and go right again. So if you have a row of ones, the machines will go tick, 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 leaving those ones, staying in state A, 
but hunting. It keeps moving to the right until, if it's a properly formed problem, it hits a plus. When it hits a plus in state A, it says, aha, that's not indicated. Uh, it replaces the plus with a one, goes into a new state B, and it goes left. And if the machine, uh, and well, the machine, let's say, will now hit a one, because it just moved right onto the plus row, at least one, one. So when it's in state B and it hits a one, it leaves the one and continues going left. So eventually it hits a blank, because there are only a finite number of symbols on the page to begin with. And when it's in state B and it hits a blank, it leaves that blank and goes back right, but now in a new state, C. So now the machine hits the first one, the very tally that it began with, but when it hits this one the second time, it's, no, it's not hitting it in state A, it's still hitting it in state C. And when it hits this one in state C, it replaces it by a blank. It erases it and goes left and goes into the rest state. So this machine will do what I described. If you give it a problem like one, one, any number of ones, plus one, 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 it will add correctly. And the way it adds is by moving to the right, so it hits that plus, replaces that plus by a one, moving to the left, so it hits a blank, goes into state uh, B, goes back to that first one, erases it, and goes into the rest of it. The amazing thing is that any computer at all, anything that any computer at all can do in principle can be done by some Turing machines. That's it. In fact, there is there's this one single Turing machine called the inversal machine with a machine table, which is at least some universal machines have not very big machine tables, which can, given enough time, do anything any computer at all can do. Now, the important thing is, what do you mean by uh, computation of Turing machine state? The answer is, to know what a Turing machine state is, I have to do what I just said. I have to tell you what a Turing machine is. I have to say what a what the formalism is, what a machine table is. And then I say, anything whose behavior can be, under a reasonable idealization, can be described by this formalism of the Turing machine, and the relevant states are its computational states. So what's, what's the upshot? Okay, well, this just finishes what I just told you. Uh, the machine I described, it's a state version of that one, one, plus one, 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 and she adds in the way I just described. I just explained what a Turing machine is, and it's a factor what a Turing machine state is. But that's quite general. If you add some other formalism, like Church's or Pliny's, etc., something analogous would hold. A formalism for computation theory, what used to be called recursion theory, some people still call it recursion theory, defines one, it defines a kind, a kind of device. We, uh, device in a very broad sense. A device need not be a machine, which is the way Alan Turing thought of it. It could be a system of equations. And two, any formalism def defines what counts as the relevant state of that device. But what I've been leading up to is the bottom of this transparency, which is that talk of computational states. When no formalism has been specified, is science fiction, not science. We don't know what we mean when we say that psychological states of human beings are functional states in this sense unless we specify what the formalism is supposed to be. I have a paper that is called, cognitive, called Functionalism, Cognitive Science or Science Fiction. I look to see if the book is in your library today, but it isn't, but it's in a new book called The Future of the Cognitive Revolution, edited uh, Oxford University Press, edited by David Johnson and Christina Annelink. Uh, Oxford University Press, edited by David Johnson and Christina Let's go back to the little Turing machine. Here's 
a formalism, a perfectly good formalism for computational science, the Turing machine formalism. Now look, if your purpose in doing computational science is as was the purpose of the founders of computation theory, Gödel, Erdogan, Turing, Kleiner, and Mill Post, simply to determine what mathematical functions are in principle commutable. If you abstract from little problems like how much real time will it take? Get as much time as you wanted and as much tape as you wanted as long a tape as you wanted, what, what mathematical functions are in principle computable? And there are other derivative notions like semi-computable and so on. Then all these different formalisms can be regarded as equivalent because the great result that was realized around roughly 1934 was the class of functions which are computable is enormously stable. Changing with the formalism you use for computation theory won't change the class. But the fact that for that purpose, the purposes of the theory of a certain class of functions, it doesn't matter which formalism you use, doesn't mean that it's irrelevant from every point of view. For example, another purpose, uh, a man called Manuel Bloom wrote a thesis that happened to be with Hartley Rogers and myself as the second reader at MIT. Uh, in the early 60s, inventing a field called complexity theory. Once you start being interested in how fast can you compute something, can you really compute it in real time, then formalisms which were equivalent from the first point of view become highly inequivalent, or may become highly inequivalent. Again, if our purpose isn't with computing functions at all, but with using, and this is the idea after all of functionalism, but with using computational formulisms as proposed, purported, hypothetical models of the mind, either the human species or of any species, then the formalism has to be such that the states are the right logical sort to be psychological states. And the states of the Turing machine are very clearly not. For one thing, states in this sense, A, B, C, D, uh, have very important properties. The machine can mean exactly one of them at a time. And that would be very useful for psychology. Even Gerald Ford <laughs> is capable of being, of being in more than one psychological state <laughs> at one time. Well. I can now be, wrap this up pretty quickly. Uh, now, at the beginning of one of these papers, the paper called Philosophy and Unmetal Life, I expanded on my qualms, which are, I've just described, about supposing that psychological states of human beings are literally Turing machines states. And I recognized that the difficulty with the notion of psychological isomorphism is that it presupposes the notion of something's being a functional or psychological description. In other words, it precedes, presupposes that we've already got a formalist. And I wanted, went on to say that it's for that reason that in my previous papers I say I'd use this Turing machine model, but that, that was no good, but that was no good for the reasons I've just pointed out, because Turing machine states just can't be psychological states. But I added, it does not seem fatally sloppy to me, although it is sloppy, I wrote. It's not fatally sloppy, but it is sloppy. If we apply the notion to systems for which we have no detailed idea at present what the normal form description would look like, systems like ourselves. I claim that even if we don't have any idea what a, quote, comprehensive psychological theory, unquote, would look like, we know enough to point out illuminating differences between any possible psychological theory or even a functional description of an automaton and a physical description. The most important of these differences is this, that systems that are models of the same psychological theory, systems that are psychologically isomorphic, so to speak, that's the terminology I introduced, 
do not have to be in the same physical state in order to count as being in the same functional state. And, and of course, you, there is actually a wonderful episode of Star Wars in which one of the more lovable androids, one of the officers wants to take it apart because it's only a machine, and another officer serves as a defense attorney and convinces everyone that it's so lovable that it really has a mind, right? Um, clearly, that machine isn't in the same physical state as a human being in terms of DNA, neurons, and so on. But at a certain level of abstraction, it is in the same psychological state. A human being, a robot with a positronic brain, imagined in Isaac Asimov's science fiction, and a disembodied spirit might be psychologically isomorphic. And if they were, they could be in the same psychological state without uh, ever being in the same physical state. At this point, although I was still a functionalist, I had begun to be aware of a very serious problem for the position. Originally, the thesis of functionalism was that our mental states are identical with our functional states, where the notion of a functional state was made clear by identifying it with the notion of a Turing machine or a probabilistic automaton state. But in, but as I've just pointed out, our mental states cannot literally be Turing machine states. They don't have the right, the right sorts of properties. So I replaced the notion of a Turing machine description with the notion of the sort of description that will be provided by an ideal psychological theory. What is an ideal psychological theory? Well, we'll know what that is when we have the normal form for psychological theories that I had earlier claimed it is, must be an inevitable part of the program of psychology to provide. But is it really any part of the program of psychology to provide any such thing? So we come to the question of the utopian character of functionalism. A psychological theory, in the ordinary sense, doesn't pretend to give a complete description of all of the human beings, or even a rat's, psychological states even if we assume we know what we mean by talking of all of an organism's psychological space. Nor does an ordinary, a psychological theory in the ordinary sense pretend to give all of the causal relations between psychological states. And that's so whether you think of vernacular psychological theories, Chomsky <coughs> theories, behaviorist theories, Freudian theories, or whatever. No one has ever claimed to provide a theory in which so much information about the state of believing, say, that there are cows in Romania, and about the connections between that state and other psychological states, and between all of these states and sensory inputs and behavioral outputs, is provided to individuate the state of believing that there are cows in Romania. A machine table does distinguish a functional state of a Turing machine from all other functional states of that machine. It individuates that state in the sense of providing a necessary and sufficient condition for being that state. Even if we're charitable, we shall have to admit that the ideal psychological theory that I envisage in my functionalist papers, the kind of theory that could provide as complete a description of our psychological states as a Turing machine table provides of the functional states of a computer, is an utterly utopian project. And if we're uncharitable, we'll say it we know not what. This sort of utopianism is also an excellent illustration of what is called scientism. Scientism is not the same thing as respect for science or desire to learn the results of science or conviction that those results are relevant to philosophical investigation. But when one is in a frame of mind, as I was, in which one fails to distinguish between science in the sense in which science is actually done in laboratories, and the most utopian sort of speculation than what is indeed in the grip of scientism. What is wrong with this sort of utopianism is not that there's something wrong about speculating about possibilities that we're not presently able to realize when we're able to make clear just what the hypothetical possibilities are. Such speculation is as old as philosophy itself. The problem is that it's completely unclear just what possibility is being envisaged when one speaks of a normal form description of the psychology of an arbitrary organism. 
and the talk about the program of psychology and, and about what is an inevitable part of the program of psychology was, I blush to admit, a way of hiding this sorry state of affairs, hiding it in the first instance from myself. The degree of utopianism required to be a functionalist becomes all the greater when one recognizes something that I had myself emphasized in my writings on the philosophy of language, namely that the meanings of our words, and I argued, and I'll, we'll be talking about that in these coming lectures, the content of our thoughts as well, are not determined simply by our functional organization in the sense in which I've been speaking of functional organization, that is, uh, our sensory inputs, transitions from one state to another, and motor outputs. According to the semantic externalism that I defended and still defend, the content of our words and thoughts is partly determined by our relations with things in our environment, including other people. We will come to that later. The fact that what causes us to speak of water is water, and not some other liquid, has everything to do with the fact that the word water refers to water. Although I did not discuss this in the functionalist papers, I was, of course, aware of it. What I would have said if someone had asked, isn't your functionalism incompatible with your semantic externalism? Is it, strictly speaking, an ideal psychological theory? Has, not, has to be not a theory of one organism in isolation, but a theory of a group of organisms, and has to include a description of their interactions with one another and with their environment and of the nature of the relevant parts of that environment. Uh, in conversation, Richard Boyd suggested the name socio-functionalism for this position. But the stipulation that the ideal psychological theory must include, properly speaking, also an ideal sociolinguistic theory makes the idea of such a theory, if possible, even more utopian. Thus, it's not surprising that by the middle 1980s, I began seriously to ask myself how meaningful, even as a regulative ideal, is the idea of an ideal psychological cum sociolinguistic theory that individuates all possible psychological states. Let us go back to the robot who is supposed to be psychologically isomorphic to a human being. Call it Leslie. Suppose we observe that Leslie produces the sound, or, or human if you prefer, it produces the sound shelleg when it snows, especially when the snow is unexpected and Leslie exhibits a startled reaction, a startled reaction at the onset of snow, he's likely to exclaim shelleg. At, first, at least it seems to us like an exclamation. It might be well, well put part of, an, of the ideal psychological theory we postulated that under normal conditions, an organism who has the belief that it is snowing in its conceptual repertoire will be caused to have that belief by the onset of snow. It is compatible with that piece of the ideal psychological theory that Leslie may believe that it is snowing on these occasions and that Leslie may be expressing that belief by saying or thinking, shall I? Unfortunately, there are a host of other possibilities. Suppose, for example, Leslie and his fellow robots have a religion of a rather primitive kind. Remember, Leslie's sort of robot is psychologically isomorphic to human beings. As the peculiarity of this religion, that snow is a sure sign that the gods are angry. In such a case, Schelleg might well mean the gods are angry. The reply of the functionist, of course, will be that still Leslie's total internal goings-on will be different in some way from the internal goings-on of a robot that thinks it's snowing when it says shelling. If we knew the totality of the robot's internal goings-on and we knew the ideal psychological theory, we would be able to determine that the content of shelling th thoughts is the gods are angry and not it's snowing. What does this require of the ideal psychological theory? It requires that the ideal psychological theory be rich enough to describe the beliefs of a believer in any possible religion, however unfamiliar. Or Leslie may not be a believer in a primitive religion. The robot may be a super scientist. It may be saying quantum state such and such when it snows. 
or making a comment in a physical theory we don't have yet. In short, it looks as if an ideal psychological theory, a theory that would be able to determine the content of an arbitrary thought, would have to be able to describe every belief of every possible kind, or at least every human belief of every possible kind, even of kinds that are not yet invented, or that go with institutions that have not yet come into existence. More and more the suspicion grows that such a theory is a pure we-know-not-what. What I think finally pushed me over the anti-functionalist edge was a conversation I had one day with Noam Chomsky, and this was really the, my reaction to that conversation was my first lecture in this, in this series. Chomsky suggested that the difference between a rational or a well-confirmed belief and a belief that is not rational and not well-confirmed might be determined by rules that are innate in the human brain. It struck me at once that it ought to be fairly easy to show using the techniques one uses to prove the Gödel theorem, that if Chomsky is right, we could never discover that he's right. And that was, of course, the, the burden of the first lecture in the series. That is to say, if what is, is rational and not rational to believe is determined by a recursive procedure, which is specified in our ideal competence description D, that it could never be rational to believe that D is our ideal competence description. And I was able to show this is the case by an argument that I sketched in this first lecture. I do not want to claim that this argument applies directly to our present discussion. We're not talking today about determining what is well confirmed, but with determining what the content of thoughts is. What did occur to me is this, what the Gödel theorem shows is that human reason is unable to survey itself well enough to see its own limits. That is to say, any description of our capacities that we're able to formalize is a description of a set of capacities that we're able to go beyond. But this suggests to me not that we can prove that functionalism can't be made less vague than it presently is, but that we have no reason to believe that it could be. In short, it suggests to me, first of all, if there is a, an ideal psychological theory, that is a theory that does everything that the functionalists want the description of human functional organization to do, let alone a normal form for the description of the functional organization of an arbitrary organism, then there's no reason to believe that it would be within the capacity of human beings to discover it. But secondly, the property of being a description of human functional organization is itself such an unclear property that the idea that there is such a description, even if we cannot recognize it, surely goes beyond the bounds of sense. And I think I will stop here in order to leave time for discussion. Stop here.